Morton is an innovative sports nutrition brand that uses a unique hydrogel technology to allow for an increased carbohydrate intake and a decreased GI distress. When used correctly, Morton will help to decrease underperformance. Since 2016, Morton has fueled some of the world's best endurance athletes, such as Elliot Kipchoge, Kenanisha Bikili, Joshua Cheptegei, Helen O'Beary, and Jan Fredino to increase performances. Welcome to episode number 137 of the Inside Running Podcast. Thank you for joining us for another week. We're back with another uh, fully loaded show. If you're about to go out for a run, let us keep you company for the next, uh, I don't know, maybe 60 minutes, and then we might have a bit of an interview at the end here. Welcome to my co-host. He's up in Canberra expecting a baby in 10 days' time. Bradley Croker, how are you going? Very well, Brady. It's good to be back. I'm uh, excited this week to hear about Moose's uh, long-anticipated 5k time trial yeah, rarely races this guy so so am i brad it's uh, it's very uh not very often that we get to hear a bit of a race recap from him so i'm looking forward to that as well how's things up in canberra yeah good good getting cold that's for sure yeah did the raiders win on the weekend they did they got they up yep. yeah right very good didn't bet yeah. on them Nah, once I lose, I'm off the bandwagon. So uh, jump back on the AFL bandwagon on the weekend, and that wasn't uh, wasn't real good either. Collingwood having a bit of a draw on uh, Thursday night, but anyway. Yeah, and Corona is uh, giving us a Monday night footy tonight because the game got uh, postponed from yesterday to tonight. So yeah, NRL are killing it though, aren't they? Compared to AFL, like the AFL can't even work out their sound noise. You know, the, yeah. fake, the fake noise that was terrible. But anyway, it's not a footy podcast. <laughs> Down in well, Angle C, Julian Spence, how are you going? I'm good, I'm good. I was watching the footy, though. I thought it was, like, so hypocritical, the AFL, when you've got, um, if you watch the game, you have 36 blokes tackling each other, like, yeah. up, up each other's ass basically, for for a good, however long the quarters are, what, 15 minutes now or something, a good hour. And then at the end of the game, they're not allowed to give each other a high five. Yeah, or so like kick a goal. Yeah. Mm. You literally just spent like a minute hugging each other, rubbing your face in each other's like laps and spitting on each other and rubbing your your hand in their face and all over their body. But oop, no high five. That's <laughs> that's dangerous. Mm. Um, real weird, weird shit to watch at the moment. It is, and like uh, we'll talk about it a bit later on, probably, but a, a real like inequality of like which sports are happening and which ones aren't. So um, we'll get to that a bit later on, I reckon. Uh, yeah, I reckon because I think there's a quote here. I want to read out this quote when we start talking about this race around the tan, and I reckon that will get us on that topic. Uh, but anyway, tell us about. Do you want to go first, Brad? We'll like, we'll leave Moose because everyone will be hanging on their seats oh. to hear about how this five k <laughs> showdown went down in Geelong. <laughs> yeah, mine will be a relatively quick week. Um, yeah, so Monday I did forty five minutes in the morning. Um, yeah, four fifteens, and I'll. So basically, every run I've had this week, my hip for the first oh, anywhere between. 30 seconds and two minutes has been like really quite painful in that like I'm sort of hobbling a little bit and then it comes good and then after that um, varies between having just some tight hip flexors or a little bit of hamstring tightness that sort of stuff Um, so anyway that was Monday 
Tuesday morning, got out for 35 minutes at 4.13s, and then that afternoon went to the AIS to do a session. I warmed up, and my hip was pretty ordinary during the warm-up, and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this session. So I stopped, had a stretch, changed shoes, did some strides. The first couple of steps of each stride was uncomfortable and then no pain whatsoever. I'm like, well, I'll give it a bit of a go, and if I feel it during the tempo, because I was going to do a 20-minute tempo, I'll um, stop. Started, first few steps a bit painful, and then absolutely no pain whatsoever um, for the session or the cool down. Um, which makes like which gives me confidence that it's something that I can continue to run on um, while trying to get on top of it with treatment. So anyway, I did 20 minutes, uh, end up averaging 311s, which uh, you know I, I guess I was relatively fresh because I hadn't I didn't do a session the week before and I only did 90k. Um, like I had a little bit of I was a little bit tight through my hip flexors, um, but I was really happy with how that felt. Um, you know, 20 minutes is not not a super long tempo, uh, but I was encouraged. Yeah, just encouraging just to get through a session, really. Um, then Wednesday was my first day back at work, and running around sort of with the kids on the oval. Anything, anytime I was doing stop start stuff, like my my back and my hip was shit all day to the point that I got home that afternoon. I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to run, and so. Said to Viv, look, I'll just go out. If I can get through 20 minutes, then that's great. Started off pain in the first 30-odd seconds to two minutes and then um, actually had a really enjoyable run. I, I ran from home down to Yerriby Pond, which I haven't done this run for ages, so it's all bike path and sort of makes you realise, because I do like pretty much every easy run out at Mulligans, so it's, you know, there's, a, there's a couple of hills, it's on the dirt. You get on the, you get on the bike path and you get somewhere that's flat and like I, I averaged 407s for 16k, but it was like one of the easiest runs I've done in ages. Like other than having a bit of a bit of tightness around my hips and, and hamstrings, like it was a super enjoyable run. So um, I went out the door expecting 20 minutes, and I'm like, um, got home after 10 miles and was quite happy. Uh, Thursday. Uh, 50 minutes at 4:23s, and this this run was a bit of a grind. Um, the pain went away, but it was just, uh, yeah, like it was. My hamstrings were pretty um, tight during it. Um, and then Friday, I was meant to do a session again, um, but motivation by this stage was just a little bit low. Um, like although I, I know that I can continue to run through it, it's sort of always at the back of your mind going, should I be running on this? Shouldn't I be running on this? And I know that if I don't run if I, if I take like a week and I don't do anything for a week, it's probably more likely for things to get worse, like in terms of my back seizing up and like the old uh, old Tom Schwartz, like I'm better off just keeping the ball rolling, like just getting through getting through something. Um, but anyway, I took Friday off um, and then Saturday went out to Mulligans with um, Viv and Lily. And uh, once again, I had no expectations, thought if I get through 30 minutes and that would be a win. Um, ended up with 42 minutes at 402s because uh, I find running fast, like I have less less discomfort when I run quicker. Um, so I had a couple of quick Ks in there at the end, like a three 332 or 330 down the hill. How's and, the photo there, Brad? The hair's looking real good. Yeah, it's been you, actually. You seen this, Moose? I have seen it. I didn't know whether I was looking at Brad Croker 2020, <laughs> Brad Croker 2002. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's been a year, I think, since I've had a haircut. Um, yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I remember just before New South Wales cross country last year, I, I pretty much shaved my head. Um, I had pretty much a shaved head at the end of June last year, um, and yeah, I haven't had a haircut since. Why? Uh, just because I can. <laughs> I don't know. Just yeah, I, I haven't really needed to. It's not like I'm in a job where my boss is going to say you need to have a haircut and look respectable. Um, you shower. Do you shower? I do shower. You do your teeth? Yep, yep, do all shave? that. Shave? Yep. Shave? Uh, occasionally. I did shave last Wednesday when I went to school. Um, but earlier in the year when my hair was long but not as long now, I did a, did a session with Crichton. I went, met at his house and uh, knocked on the door and he answers it and he goes, shit, you wouldn't be getting a job at my law firm with hair like that. <laughs> so <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be stuck out the, in a back room somewhere. So uh, anyway, no, it and looks then, good. You look happy. Looks like a good yeah. good afternoon out at Mulligans. Well, you never know. You know, forty in August. You never know when my hair's going to start to fall out. So shit, I make, hope I look that good at forty. Need to make the most of it. This looks like a fifteen year old kid. I know. 
He does. He's got 15 year old leg. We'll put it on our social too. media, guys. There's a lot of ladies to be very happy with that photo, I reckon. So um, Brad, Sunday. Yeah, and then Sunday, I um didn't like organize. I hadn't organized to meet anyone just because I wasn't. Yeah, I'm sort of not sure how what I'm going to be doing from day to day with my body. So um yeah, had a sleep in, chilled out for a bit, and then ended up running at midday. And um I didn't get too. I ran out at Mulligans, but I didn't go sort of my normal loop. I stayed a little bit closer just in case I wanted to sort of pull the pin and started off. And uh, it was definitely more enjoyable than the week before. Uh, but I find it hard. And do you, do you guys ever find this when you have when you go for a run, but you don't have a specific plan of how far you're going to go? It sort of fucks with your mind a little bit early on in the run because you always have this. Well, I could stop. Whereas if I go out and I know I've got two, you know, if I plan to do two hours, then you sort of mentally prepare yourself for two hours. So because I thought to myself, well, maybe I'll do ten miles, maybe I'll do ninety minutes. Um, that first half an hour, I was just like, oh, it's yeah, it was a bit of a grind. But I had um, road to nowhere for the first hour, and then I had the um, I had a uh, there was a chat that I think University of Tasmania did with um, Nick Earl, Stuart McSwain, and Josh Harris. So I had that for the second half of my run, and having those podcasts definitely um, from sort of thirty minutes in just took my mind off sort of the shit run, and um, yeah, got through it. So I ended up doing twenty six k at four oh nines for a week of exactly 100k so look got one session in which was pretty good got uh, i guess now 48 so you know classifies as a long run and 10 mile midweek run so just um yeah keeping the ball rolling and uh, had treatment again today uh so just trying to yeah trying to get on and i have treatment again on thursday night so just um keep chipping away you used to never listen to podcasts, Brad, when you're – like you haven't listened to any of my interviews I've ever done, I don't reckon, and now you're listening to everything. No, I've li- listened to a few – yeah, f- listened to a few interviews. Um, yeah, I generally listen to music, but, uh, yeah, I've sort of enjoyed having a few different podcasts recently. Definitely takes – definitely makes the run go quicker. Mm. I've, I've been listening to a good one today. It's going to be my podcast for a long time, I reckon. It's called The Unforgiving 60. Um if you remember I that, saw that on your Strava, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a poem by some bloke and um, the Unforgiving Minute is Ron Clark's book's named after that. The Unforgiving Minute, right? Yeah. Yep. And um, and, and this, this is called The Unforgiving 60 because it's the same poem that they've taken it from. Um, but, yeah, it's so – like when you have a good podcast, I'm, I'm almost excited to go running just to mm. like – it's just enjoyable. It's like watching your favourite TV show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's almost like you get the run for free, like yeah. isn't it? You're just like, all right, this podcast goes for an hour and ten. My my run's going to go for sixty or seventy. You're like, all I've got to do is listen to this. Like, if you get, you actually got to go for a run. Mm. But it the, probably, it probably right. slows me down a little bit as well because when I have yeah. um, when I have music on, you know, you'll get a song that you sort of like. Oh, I like this song, and you sort of pick up the pace a little bit. Whereas when you're listening to a podcast and you're sort of trying to concentrate a bit more than you would if you're listening to music. Um, yeah, I probably run a little bit slower. Yeah, how good was Stewie on that chat? That the um, oh. the, the audio that Utah's gave us, like he just. Oh yeah. man, like the thing that really struck me was he's a guy that's one of the best in the world and trains largely with just a stopwatch. Doesn't yeah. worry about GPS, um, which is pretty cool to hear somebody at that level training that way. So that was um. That was one highlight of of the uh, of the chat, that's for sure. And has like days off and stuff as well. Like just doesn't seem to buy into worrying about things too much. If he's got a little niggle, just has a day off, gets it right. Is yeah, all good again. Yeah. Like doesn't push through. Um, and, um, doesn't keep the ball rolling. <laughs> so well, and so down to earth as well. Like you know, he was uh, he was Nick Earl, basically giving oh, him yeah. some lip about every single race that Nick Earl had beaten him in, and Stewie was like sort of just taking it, going, yeah, yeah, I, re- I remember all of those um, those head to heads. And whereas if I was Stu, I'd be like, well, Nick, your uh, 5k PB is now about my tempo pace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, he's too nice to say that. It's pretty polite. You, you don't worry about the peasants when you're Stewie. Yeah. <laughs> He was there, he seemed like to enjoy the conversation though, like he was laughing along with Nick. Yeah, well I would have been with you, Brad, and just slipping back. But anyway, 
That's on our Patreon. Thanks to the University of Tasmania Athletes Club for recording that and then uh, giving us permission to use that audio. If you're wondering where you can find it, Moose, tell us about this week. A bit of a down week, a bit of a taper week. All the boys huh. on the track on Saturday. What happened? Well, you've really beat it up <laughs> because it wasn't quite what you're making it out to be. I can guarantee you that. It was a slight down week. I ran 151k, but yeah, I'm not. Freshen. I'm not. I'm not really having big up weeks. So you can call it a down week, but I don't really have up weeks at the moment. I'm just ticking along. Been training the house down, Moose. Not it's really. Affecting big, big things. I had him in 5k PB shape, shape, I reckon, last week, I said, so I'm looking forward to hearing this result. This is why you guys aren't either A, as good runner as I am, or B, as good a coach, because you think I'm in PB shape. You're going to say, this is is why you're not elite like me. (laughs) We can use that term. I mean, you said it, but uh, Monday, jogs in the morning, um, Anglesey, I've got some good loops going now. Blake, Blake O's come down and ran with me on Monday afternoon. We did a good loop around Anglesey. Um, he, yeah, he's a, uh, he's a fair, fair complainer about pace, but when you actually run with him, he's the guy half-stepping you out the front, but then he'll complain about how fast the run was later. <laughs> yeah, it's quite annoying. Um, eight by 600 Tuesday morning. It was it's cold and my f- fucking feet were slipping on the track again. It's just just got this fine layer on it, like frosty, um, on a tu- on the Tuesday mornings at the moment, and and there's just no purchase for the shoes to take. So I was battling again, eight by six hundred, one forty three, one forty four, with seventy seconds rest. It just not the greatest session in the world. Um, I hit what I needed to the splits. Going through in like 68, I think it was. Um, 68. I was wondering what the 400 meter split was there. 600 yeah. means nothing to me. Six, yeah, I know. Because you uh, just never do them. I had to do the math on that beforehand. Uh, 600. Oh, 68, 250 pace. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good. That's a good workout. That that time in the morning. That you, feel, you feel like you're pushing it, Moose? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I'd go through like 400 meters and think, damn it, I've still got 200. This is already hard. And in the morning, that's what I felt like the last month, I reckon, every morning workout. Whereas I reckon I get that in the afternoon, and that is super easy to me, that session. But we don't know because I didn't do it in the other. But got it done and because I did have a workout. I did have a time trial thing on Saturday. Then on the next day, ran in, um, ran in Ballarat with, with Watto. So ran with um, – it was pretty cold. Got, I, he's – I've caught the tracksuit bug from him, so now I roll out in full tracksuit kit. <laughs> running pants. I didn't even know what running pants were like four years ago. Now I've got a full collection. Of, not tights, actual running pants. And they well, are, so, what, like, what you do you find the difference pants. between tracksuit pants and tights in terms of, like, warmth? And, oh, yeah. and also just, like, feel. Like, I'd imagine I'd feel real sloppy running in tracksuit pants. Like, it, like it would turn the run into a grind. Ah, so the good tracksuit pants, let's not call them tracksuit pants, they're running <laughs> pants. So the good running pant, they have tapered calves, so the calves come in like a tight, and then they come up to around the knees, and then they start to, to loosen, and, and you get a bit of a drop crutch from them. So they're warm. Right now, actually. I wear a pair to bed with my uh, bed socks. You sleep I always, in, sleep I always in thought them. they were just tracksuit pants. Yeah, they're like an old pair, but they got zip down the um down the Achilles, the calf, and yeah, then they, yeah, they go as you were describing it. I was looking down and going, yeah, we're ticking a lot of boxes. Yeah, I've got a pair of these things on. Go for a run. Do you ever warm up in them? Nah, because I wear tights if I want to wear warm up. If yeah, I'm see, down that's there. the difference. Once you get a running pan on, you'll never go back to tights because the tights are like skin tight and they don't really cut the wind down. The pants mm-hmm. have like a shell layer that cuts the wind, and when it rains, you've got a another like outer layer to the pant whereas there's a soft material on the inside so mm. they do have some benefits do you yeah. uh do you feel bad now about all the times you've bagged ash tracksuits watson oh there's a difference in the tracksuits i'm wearing to what he wears so he's like perennial tight ass he buys sh- like shit from kmart and runs in it so <laughs> he's not looking good in his running pants Whereas I look a million bucks next to him. <laughs> Have you got an Adidas pair with a three stripe down the side? Remember those nah. old tracky pants from school? Can guarantee you he would have some two stripe get ups <laughs> from the local market or something. The Lowe's. big Lowe's. W, yeah, 
He was telling me how he bought all this Puma running kit off the internet the other day and they didn't deliver it on time. So, like, he pressed them for a fucking free shit and he's, oh. <laughs> hey, you, um, you paint him as a tight ass, though, but I had to send him some beers the other day and he gave me his address, but he forgot to tell me his postcode. So I just Googled his address, like copy and pasted it in, and then his house come up, like, you know, like when it's previously been sold and stuff. And I clicked on it and looked at the pictures. His house is awesome. Yeah, it's a nice house for sure. He had a great house. That's what I mean. Stuff. The guy earns more money than any of us, and his wife does the same job, Jen. So he's fucking loaded, right? He oh, doesn't double spend a cent. Yeah, no, he's, he's, he's incredibly tight. House. But then he does buy that shit. And he probably found it on some bargain website, that house, somehow. <laughs> probably had coupons for it. <laughs> it's a nice yeah. house anyway. Keep going. Uh, yeah, keep going. So that is, I don't know. You're in Ballarat. Yeah, I got down that afternoon to, um, I worked that day, obviously. Then I ran in the evening in the dark around Anglesey. Uh, I'm starting to get back to the old haunts, go through the golf course. A lot of kangaroos in Anglesey. When you're running in the dark, you've got these massive roos just pop out of nowhere right in front of you. Give you a bit of a fright. Next morning, had a jog. That afternoon, um, I think... Ali rode with me. We did a good loop around Anglesey. It was it was a beautiful day. Like we're coming down this hill, ocean in the background, in the foreground. We're running down into it. I wish we had a camera. That would have got some good, um, good, good gram snaps. Three twenty four p.m. Oh, so good. That's yeah. early. It's school still on at three twenty four p.m. The, the goal is to get out and um, get some sun on me. You know like vitamin d important yeah, this time of the year yeah short on sun and i thought this is a good chance to get some sun i know ellie worried about her tan she was like let's go early so we we didn't get a lot of tan but um we did get some good views so next day ran with a mate sugar kane his name is he footy player he's starting to run more oh gee i love beating him up through these um trails in anglesey <laughs> he he runs around the river and he pounds that like he, he makes himself hurt every day, but he doesn't do a lot of hills. So we got on these trails and all of a sudden I'm just hearing this breathing behind me, just like huffing and puffing. And I was feeling pretty good. So just kept him close enough where he has to keep up, but far enough away where he has to really work to keep up, you know? And as soon as you start to put a bit of distance in where he can sort of relax and think the brakes aren't being had, I'll just slow down a little bit so he catches up. So it's just like, oh, there's something about just making a man hurt. I just really enjoy on, it. On an easy run. Yeah, yeah, just love it. Just love, love, love being a prick, you mean? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> Especially when you know he's a tough bastard because he is and he's not going to just fall away. He's going to be there. He won't let it. He won't let you get away. He'll he'll make sure he sticks with you. But you know he's having to dig real deep to get it done. <laughs> anyway, um, had that afternoon off, ran this time trial the next day. We had a good bunch. Shit, we had like how many people? 12, 13 of us? All in the um, Strava. I'm giving more kudos now. Yeah, some good. Oh, look, there's some comments getting around. I'm just having a look for the first time. Um, everyone ran pretty well. Uh, we had it. So I guess the goal... We had a couple trying to break 15. Blake was trying to break 15. We had um, Hutchie was trying to break 15 for the first time. And then I was there. And then Pete, Pete Kerr was like, I can pace you for, for 3K. So I thought this is probably a good chance to, um, to run with the pack and help the boys out a little bit by putting another body in the pack. So we ticked along. Um, Pete was pretty good with his pacing. We went 257, 303, three minutes. So hit it right on nine minutes at 3K. I felt like that that was actually just really cruisy. Um, I could have, I, I, was, I was feeling super easy. So I, the next lap, I just kicked it down a bit. I was there, Hachi was there with me at that point. Um, but then once I kicked it, picked it up, it just didn't feel great. I ended up running, so I just, I, Hutchie dropped off after that lap and I just ran the rest in by myself. Ran 1450, I think. Um, I didn't stop my, I saw my watch late, but I'm pretty sure it was 40. Oh, six six yeah. seconds late. Yeah, I'll stop, 15, oh, I didn't stop the watch. 1456 on Strava. 
Ah, well, I couldn't see the, the <laughs> digital clock. There's it no stop. distance runner in the world that takes six seconds to stop I'm, the uh, watch. I'm going to take 14.56, which means that you, <laughs> your kick down was going from three-minute Ks to 258s. Oh, shit. Let me look. I'm <laughs> fucking Massive sure. kick down. I thought this would be thrashy he was doing before the 5K or something, Brad, when he uploaded it. 14.56. And what about your distance as well? 5.06. Like, that's – especially if you stopped your watch late and went went a bit further. Like, that's – um. I am looking at it. That is a lapse time. Pretty accurate. Yeah, it, lapse, lapse time's 14.56. Moving time's 14.56. Is it? Yeah. 5.06K. Yeah. Actually, now that I'm looking, it does look like I've – it does look like I've run 14.56. I thought you were doing the old um, just go off the GPS, go off the five, <laughs> 5K. I'm pretty sure when I finished, like, the when I went through the finish line, I looked down and it said 14.50 on my watch. Um, I'm sure of that, but maybe I, I fucked it. I don't know. Okay. Well, whatever. It's not – I run 14.50, it's shit. I run 40.50. 56 it's still shit <laughs> who cares yeah. uh i'm not changing it on fucking strava though i'll take that i might lose kudos off that um but yeah got it. it i'm not the kind of guy who can get up for this shit you know these time trials i just don't it doesn't bother me i'd rather i i was caught 9k i'm like oh hachi i could get you through today you could run sub 15 and then i'm like no no this is supposed to be a time trial you're supposed to get a hard effort so then i thought all right, well, dump him. Can't lose this one either. So let's just get rid of him on this first lap <laughs> and then battle into the finish. It turns out he had a massive shit one. If I ran 14.56, what did he – he must have run. He yeah, was he way – He ran like 15.03 or something, didn't he? he just missed so 15. Much, he was so <laughs> much further behind me than that. So that doesn't make any sense. You can look in that photo. Because when we thanked him a couple of weeks ago, they were talking about how his PB was like 15.00 and yeah. how he'll break 15 soon and – Look yeah. at this. Look how far back he is. This wasn't even – anyway, 14.50, I'm taking it. It was all right, whatever. It doesn't mean anything. And I'm just glad these fellas, so these guys, instead of going out and finding some bullshit GPS course, mm. they did it on the track. So yeah. kudos to them for that because there's a lot of bullshit going on right now. And the only way to get a proper, like, credible time is to do it on a, a course you know is accurate – or, or something like a track. Mm-hmm. Um, like park run courses, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. We'll give a park run course because we know that people take it in the past. Road loops, okay. If But if we're yeah, not those... back road, that's okay, I reckon. There's a few bad parks out there that we know are bad, but no one gives it seems to give a shit. And then yeah, I saw out one. back, zero corners. Yeah, like there's some downhill ones going on. Like, it might be super accurate in terms of how long it is, but then you look, they drop 80 metres over 5K. That's not on either. So get yourself to a track. There's a few open. I had a guy in Sydney that I coach. He did a 10K time trial on, on Saturday, which, like, 10K on the track, pretty pretty much on your own. <laughs> That's pretty brutal. That's nasty. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't want that. Don't want – but mm. – At least if you know what shape you're in, though – you can then, like, just hit the laps pretty – you're not going to blow up if you do it correctly. Like, if you know a nice, comfortable pace that you reckon you can hold, then you just check your watch to every lap and, and keep it dialed in and just try to switch the mind off that you're doing 25 laps. Yeah. Still, it does mess with your mind, though, because at some point you're going to start to hurt, like, you know, that's seven, about 7K out or so. You know – Sorry, 3K to go. There's no lap counters either. So you're, like, in your head trying to do as much math as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to work out what pace you're on at what lap you're at. That's tough. Like, Did you have someone yelling laps? Nah. Oh, sort of. Ali was there. She was yelling splits, but I'm, I don't know how accurate they were. I think she – I don't it's know not, about that. It's not that. rocket science. Well, I know. Tell me about it. Just hit split on your watch. <laughs> the uh, hit out will be good for you, though, Moose. That will bring you up a bit. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I won. I won the race. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Tell you what, you, you wouldn't win in Ballarat running times like that, though, would you? Like you moved back down the coast. Tell me someone who's faster than me in Ballarat right now that could oh, run faster than geez, that. Geez, it'd be embarrassing if you had the best time in Ballarat. Hollis was, like, is in Melbourne now. He ran, he ran in Ballarat tonight. Yeah, well, he's a <laughs> Melbourne boy now. So, nah, 
No, there's not too much going on. Ballarat and Geelong, I reckon, pretty close in terms of if you're going to put them together right now. Good groups in both. Good people in both. I like we're equal. Even Stevens. Okay, next day ran uh, ran a loop round Anglesey, Belbray area. A bit less muddy than last week. It was good. Um, 26K and then ran in the afternoon. There, I worked out there's nothing longer. There's no longer kilometres in running than the seventh kilometre of a Sunday afternoon run. That thing can just go for days and days and days, that last K, especially when you mistime your loop, when you're running up and down your street trying to get that last K. Oh, it's like four hours worth in one one kilometre. You love the old double Sunday, though. You I, always do I it. used to love it. I'm not loving it. I need beers and friends afterwards. Otherwise, it's not quite the same. Yeah, very good. I'm going to go through my week. A uh, bit of a recovery week. I had that track 10K last weekend, and I was a bit beat up from that. So 13K easy on Monday at 4.31s. Didn't get out till about 11 o'clock. Had a few beers Sunday, Arvo. Woke up a bit seedy. Wasn't too bad, though. Just uh, chilled out a bit in the morning and... Yeah, it was slow at the door. Tuesday, I felt all right, though. Like, 4.31s felt pretty similar to what every Monday feels like. Tuesday, though, um, did an hour again. It must have been like 13.5K at 4.36s, and my right hammy was just a bit tender. Kind of, I don't know, it was just a bit locked up. Or it felt like because the right hammy was tender that everything was kind of locked up, and I just wasn't covering the ground well at all. Just, um, just felt pretty shit out there, really, and... Got out for 7K in the afternoon at 4.33s. Wednesday, I still decided I didn't want to do a workout because I wanted to have a few days um, where I felt better before I tried anything quicker. Went out for 16K in the morning at 4.22s. Listened to um, the Tim Minchin interview on Will Osophy, actually, Will Anderson's podcast. Really recommend that one. It, um, yeah, it had some really good content in there for people interested in that kind of uh, podcast. And then got out for 7K in the afternoon at 4.28s. Thursday did two days of 10K, so 10K in the morning at 4.28s, 10K in the other at 4.29s. Hammy pain was almost uh, pretty much gone, so decided I was going to do a workout on Friday. Did 12 minutes at kind of steady pace, average 3.14s um, to start off with, then had three minutes float at about 3.45 pace, and then 10, 20 seconds, like pretty upbeat, hard with uh, 40 seconds jog between another three minutes float and then another 12 minutes at the end but this was uh probably close to threshold pace average 305 for that last 12 minutes and and felt much better felt good no soreness was back covering the ground well it was just um super cold i think it was like one degrees and just super foggy so it feels like you're just instantly running in a cloud and you're just kind of getting wet while you're running it was um not too too good out there on friday morning but we got it done um 7k in the afternoon at 4.17s and that's when i really felt good like just felt like i was back covering the ground well i kind of titled that one on strava best i've felt all week so it probably nearly took me a whole week to be feeling good the saturday to the friday kind of turnaround sunday recovery after the friday so i did 16k in the morning at 4.20s 10k in the arvo at 4.15s and then sunday went out to the barma forest with archie again um, we got rolling. We were planning to do two hours, and we ended up doing two hours at 3.57 pace, which was a uh, tick over like 30K. And, yeah, it, um, it felt good. I think I, I knew we were ticking along, and because we'd only done the one workout, we just kind of kept it rolling and probably – I don't know how you do that every week, Bradley. That's um, well, that I kind don't, of average. I don't, yeah. average. I don't average 3.57s. Yeah, you get close to that, don't you? I I had the uh, – yeah. I had the, I had the shortest and slowest average out of the three out of the three of us, I think, this week. Jeez. What, for the whole week for, or what, what did you average moves for your long for Sunday? No, nah, about that. Four oh six, four oh five. Yeah, I was four oh nine. So I had the I had the slowest average for the long run this week. Yeah, you probably climbed eight hundred meters or something. No, nah, like not no, it was like two uh two hundred and something, not much at all. Yeah, we're about 150, but it's like sandy and stuff out there, so you got to work pretty hard. But um, given we don't know the one workout and we're not working out till Wednesday this week, I kind of said to Archie, we, we can do this, but I don't want to get in the trap of doing it every single week. And then because we went a bit faster, I did another 30 minutes in the afternoon on Sunday for um, 
yeah, 30 minutes, 4.32s, 170K a week. So it was kind of just good to get some some mileage in, only the one workout, solid long run. But the main focus was to recover for, um, yeah, this week of training, get over that track 10K. Definitely takes me longer than it used to to get over a 10K race. And, yeah, it always feels like those lower leg kind of sore spots don't happen anymore, being in the um, next percent. But, yeah, I definitely feel it up in my hips and my hammies and, kind of lower back kind of area so um yeah something it happened i remember the same thing happened after zadipec and just something that i've got to prepare for and be useful now mm. good so you feel good again feel good 5k time trial coming up brad in a couple of weeks mm. see if we can go I reckon, you'll, uh, I reckon you'll do that i reckon hey yeah uh, let's thank some patreon supporters eh all right hey, i'll keep it off you go for it uh, this week, shout outs to Joshua Stewart. He lives up in uh, Raymond Terrace, New South Wales, near Newcastle. He uh, got a photo with Sally Pearson once, owns a dog, is possibly a welder, and he rides a mountain bike. Uh, ran 89 minutes at the Central Coast Half Marathon for his first half. So um, good to crack that 90 minute barrier. And thanks for your support, Joshua. Had some fun going through Josh's Instagram today. One of those people that was fairly loose when he was a few years younger and just kept all the photos up there. It's a good laugh, Josh. Probably, uh, yeah, probably to take some of that stuff down, I reckon, if you ever ever got a job interview or anything like that. Who are you thanking, Moose? Uh, I'm going to thank John Vaitkunas. He's from Surrey Hills, Victoria. It's a very wealthy suburb, I think. So John's probably very well off. He couldn't find many results post-2007, so these could be outdated. 36.23 at AV 10K, AV Winter 10K. What is that, like Sandown or something you're calling that? Or Albert yeah, Park? I don't know. It was just, no, definitely because it was like 2005, I think. Leamington, like, maybe. Maybe. It didn't say it just said AV Winter 10K, but I did see one of his um, 15K results, and that's when they used to do the 15K around Albert Park. Did you ever run that, or that too young for you? Uh, I know Louis Rowan won that one year. Uh, yeah, this was the year he ran it. Yep. Oh, yeah. It's and good. I reckon even Scott was in the lead. Um, Scott Nicholas, Scott Rantel was in the pack. Magnus um, Nicholson. Yeah, shit, I've seen this photo. Yeah, that was that same year. Yep. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, 122 at Burnley Half Marathon, 314 Melbourne Marathon in the year 2000. So that's 20 years ago. Damn. Mm. Um, runs for Box Hill Athletics Club has run. 266.7 kilometers on Strava in 20. That's not a lot of running. Nah, John. he keeps a low profile, John. I don't know whether you're on private. Maybe he's injured. Maybe um, maybe that is a lot for John, but I don't know. You've just put that in and thrown me. Just trying to put a stat in there. Couldn't find much on John, but thanks for your support, John. Thank you, John. I'm going to thank another John, Jonathan Jackson from uh, Auckland, New Zealand. Check out these PBs, boys. 3.47 for 1,500, 4.10 for the mile, 8.17 for 3K, 14.23 for 5K, 30.16 for 10, 67.22 for the half, and 2.26 for the marathon. Shapes that pretty well with... Uh, I reckon my PB is like exactly like that at one stage. He's um he's going all right. Got you got got you well and truly in the fifteen hundred though. Yeah, he's definitely got a bit of speed, hasn't he? With that that fifteen, the mile and the three k, he's got me pretty easy. Mm. Yeah, um, he's come second in four marathons. Never won one. Come second in four different ones and third once. Um, he's also got a sixth place in there, and he was 120th at Berlin in 2017. That was the year that we went over, wasn't it? Mm. When you got oh, injured, Brad. Yeah. He was, yep. He, yep. He was on the start line with us that day. Um, he's coached by Barry McGee, one of the Lydi- one of Lydiard's original men. Barry got bronze medal at the Rome Olympic Marathon in 1960. Got a couple of dogs, and uh, when he's a bit older, he reckons he's going to leave the big smoke and move to Nelson the homeland of the great Rod Dixon. So that's some pretty mm. cool stuff in there about Jonathan Jackson. And thank you, boys, all men this week, for their um, Patreon support. We really and, appreciate uh, it. And Jono Jackson, has all, you know that um, the famous long run loop of Lydiards, like the 35K or whatever it is? Can't remember. Yeah. Is it like, uh, what do you Water- pronounce it? Yeah. yeah. How do you pronounce it, Moose? I'm going for, with the Watarua. The yeah. Watarua. But, yeah, um, it's in their notes there. He said he's done that more times than he can count, but like, like that's a run that I would love to do one day. 
Don't you reckon? Would you guys love True. to do that run? We always have these hypothetical questions about like where would one of your runs be, and that would be, yeah, you're right, Brad. A lot of history has happened on that. Yeah, it's just such an iconic, like in terms of distance running and sort of the, uh, I guess the start of you know the, the whole um, that Lydiard system would be pretty cool to get out there and see what it's like. I think it's about six hundred. Uh, between six and seven hundred meters of climbing over the thirty-five k. I had to look at a few people's Strava. Um, it's it's really like the Fernie Creek, like the Dandenongs, the Yu Yangs, the um, like Ballarat, Canberra. You know, when we go out for hilly long runs, I reckon that's what it's really formed from. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Um, it seems to be – it's relatively flat to start with and then there's a really long climb and then it's rolling up the top and then it's actually a pretty decent down, um, which, like, I know, like, at Stromlo, for example, it's generally um, – the hills are spread out, but you don't finish on a on a solid downhill, whereas I wonder whether for the marathon actually having, like, a good downhill section – at the end of a long run to sort of bash up your legs has a bit of bit of value. Smash up your quads. Yeah. And yeah, isn't it um, asphalt, right? Yeah, didn't Rod Dixon say that? Yeah, I, I think heard it, it is. somewhere. Or well, he said it's been paved now. There's a footpath going along the road or something like that. Mm. I've heard someone talk mm. about it. maybe Aaron Polford as well. Or anyway, Dixon, I just one of those I, boys. Yeah. If we get a hypothetical about a, a course you'd want to run, then pencil me in for that one. If I forget. Yeah, answering the questions before they come in. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about some running news, fellas. Uh, Botanical Gardens, the tan. A couple of, uh, or I guess one kind of record attempt down there. A bit of a race was set up on Friday morning. Um, Stewie missed Craig Mottram's record by four seconds. He was first one to complete a lap in 10 minutes and 12 seconds. Jack Ray in a second, 10 minutes, 16 seconds. Sam McEntee was third, 10 minutes and 20 seconds. This was star-studded, like Dave McNeil was fourth in 10.23, Brett Robinson fifth in 10.25, Jordan Williams 10.26. There were a whole lot more people than that there, though. If you've seen the photos, it looked like there was maybe like 15, 16 people um, on the start line of the men's ready to do a fast lap. I know Ben Buckingham, a previous guest, was there, Tom Thorpe, Jeff Risley, uh, Peter Boll, Joseph Deng, whoever put this field together. I think it was um, Nick Badeau with some of the stuff we'll read out in a second, did a pretty good job of bringing all the different training groups together in the men's field because, um, yeah, a lot of those guys have, have different coaches and they've all come together for one fast lap around the 10. Before we talk about the women's race, boys, anyone want to make any comments about the men's? It was fast. Uh, yeah, super impressive. Like Jack, um, I know you've written down here, Brady, Jack's was probably run of the day in terms of where he's come from, coming off that stressy. Like he's got back into to really good shape and uh, doesn't know how to pull it out on race day when he needs to. So, um, What would his 5K be, do you know? Well, his actual P, official PB. Yeah, like, it'd be, like he finished four seconds behind Stewie, but I reckon his 5K... PB would be a, a big, big chunk behind Stewie's actual 5K PB and Mottram's if we're throwing him up with those two names. He'd be, well, he would have run, what, 13, 13.30 something probably? 13.41, just yeah. looked it up then. Yeah. So he's in pretty good company to a, a sub-13 guy and a 13.05 guy. Yeah. But just seeing how deep it was, like I remember, um, like I heard people always say, like if you're running uh, like if you're running around the 10 in, I don't know, 10, 10.50, like that's moving, and I remember the one time I was down there for ten relays. Harry Summers ran ten thirty seven, and um, he went past me just at the top of Anderson Street, and he was uh, he was motoring then. So and that and that was ten thirty seven. So to think that these guys are running low tens, um, that's that's super impressive. No, oh, it is for sure, isn't it? And um, yeah, the deepness we've kind of spoken about already of that field. Sam McEntee just just hooking around there in a t-shirt. You guys were giving me crap about getting beaten by Andre the other week in a t-shirt. He looked like he had the long shorts on too. Sam McEntee, that was close to our uh, mm. yeah best swag. With a hat sure. on, with a hat on, long shorts yeah. and a t-shirt, and ran ten twenty. So it's given us a pretty good indication about uh, some of the form these guys are in. Moose, what do you think about the men's? Anything else to add? No, it just it was interesting. I reckon that the um, gap maybe was formed from Stewie and the rest in the first kind of like 500, 1K, and then it seemed to stay for the rest of it based on the photos I saw anyway. Because uh, what did he finish? How many seconds in front? 
four, four seconds. Four yeah. Sec- oh, yeah, that looked like four seconds in the first K, to be honest. So perhaps he, um, perhaps they were clawing him back late, or perhaps uh, they they ma- maintained that distance the, the whole way. I reckon they must have clawed him back late a little. We'll put this uh, – yeah, coming down the hill. We'll put this um, link in the show notes. It's runthetan.net. It's got the fastest 100 times ever – ever ran around there they've just updated them after this last friday and brad croker still coming in at number 93 can you believe it <laughs> there you go hey a fair way behind those boys about a about a minute behind jack i'd imagine yeah yeah i don't know let's talk about the women's race uh lyndon hall she uh, crossed the line did the lap first fastest in 1208 she uh now equaled the fifth fastest time uh, in the women's section, she equaled that with Sinead Diver from a couple of weeks ago when she had to go with Jen Lacaz. Uh, Andrea Sekafan from Canada was second. She's broken 15 minutes for 5K, so I was actually thinking she might have been a bit of a chance to take down mm-hmm. Jen's record of 11.57. She ran 12.22. Sarah Billings came in third, 12.26. I think Nat Rule did start. Not sure if she had a pacing job. Um but didn't finish. They only had the top three in the article from the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, thoughts there, guys? Linda's actually, well, she's obviously going pretty well to equal that fifth spot. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, she 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 is. Uh, she ran, she's a 1,500-metre runner, really, uh, whereas Jen's probably closer to that to what her thing is, is 3K. So maybe stepping outside her comfort zone a little more. Mm. Um but and slightly hilly as well like uh, who who knows really like where someone's strength lies she might come out and bust a 5k that we never like expect one day and then all of a sudden she's a 5k runner but uh, i know she was saying that there was a bit of traffic as well which uh, i'm not sure whether she had anybody on the bike sort of clearing the way or not um i did read somewhere that she was sort of yelling out a fair bit which uh yeah it has to be worth a few seconds if you're uh trying to talk at going at that sort of effort yeah, mm. I read that as well. It was in the article and it appeared in like the Sydney Morning Herald and it was in the Herald Sun down here in Victoria as well. So it was really good. It was getting some mainstream media. Um, and this bit of information, this tells us where it come from. The race was put on by coach Nick Badeau, who out of frustration at his own sports in Isha is in doing anything while contact sport managers to recommence competition wanted to offer athletic athletes a chance to resume competing mm. Every, everyone is anxious for something to go on there is horse racing there's afl there's rugby league competitive sports with physical contact we can't see why you can't have running races we can't sit on our hands waiting for the people who run the sport to do it he said thought that nailed it on that absolute head mm. like, what about what about how that is that like that is nailing it right brady yeah considering what happened after you at, at your race in bendigo right can you just tell everyone what happened there yeah uh we just got we got asked to pull down any like social media stuff because we um we weren't social distancing on the athletics track there was a photo of like maybe six of us in a line when we were, when we were doing the 10k on the track last week and yeah, we got um, we got. Well, I didn't directly, so I'm kind of talking third or fourth hand here. But someone was contacted by an official at Athletics Victoria after someone had emailed a photo in, um, saying how are these guys running so close together. And then in response, there was a bit of a please explain issued, and were asked to remove all photos, which I think <laughs> nobody did. I think, I think they would have said we're going to keep the photos up there. Yeah. And then, the, then these guys rolled around and it made us all look like saints in Bendigo the week before. So, um, yeah, it was – because we well, – yeah, it's it's really frustrating yeah. watching yeah. the horse racing on TV. It's really frustrating watching the AFL. And then it's really frustrating to, um, you know, not have any options for us to race in what should be one of the sports that goes back first. Like, and, I can't see mm, why not. You owe them – shit brady those guys owe you things like they should be thanking you for building this sport instead when you go and try to do something try to get people involved they do this fuck that yeah like yeah, yeah you feel like a naughty boy in the school principals having a crack at you yeah there's, they just have four guys of, break 29 yeah. 40 yeah and there's six of you and how many how many thousands of people did they have a protest in melbourne yeah, and, and you've got, and you've got six people. Uh, yeah. yeah, and you pay memberships to them. They don't give you shit. They put on some races poorly during the year. Sixteen years of AV membership. 
Yeah. And yeah. you go and do a fucking time trial you've organised by yourself at a track with no one there and there's six people running and you get told to pull social media down? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, we're going real good. Thanks, guys. Thanks, fucking administrators of our sport. Yeah, and I think Nick's done a good job of summarising this, saying, like, yeah, come on, this is – we need – if you guys aren't going to put stuff on, we'll do it. And I'm like – I kind of like it a bit because I think the athletes – I know I was talking to the boys who did that 10K with me – couple of weeks ago that we're like all right what's next let's get something fired up and and brad and i have been kind of talking mm. about planning this event in uh in july which we think is going to be really fun and just got to wait wait for a few things to kind of get locked down there but we should be able to have a have an announcement soon because these governing bodies are just they're just not doing anything like they're what nick say sitting on their hands mm-hmm. it feels like that we hear nothing from them other than them wishing people happy birthday on social media like it's Give us something, federations. Let's go. Yeah, like it's, it's time. Things are opening. Be ahead of the game. Oh, they Don't, did put they did put on an award ceremony, but left one of the best runners out. I watched that the other day. Not one runner won any award. <laughs> like Clifford and Roger didn't get this. Um, the Para won. Obviously, Ali didn't get the old Jess Hull or Jen Gregson didn't win the the um, the open one um stewie didn't get the men's open one. like there was all just field events or or sprints or multi-events kind of thing which they need to split that up like make it runner of the year make it thrower of the year make it jumper of the year you can't compare a thrower with a with a sprinter or a distance runner and then well, like, yeah, you watch this that comes... there's 150 people watching that on a live stream you're like like there's not no engagement there this comes back to what like the root of the sport where track and field is linked and and perhaps we do need to start separating in order to um, become more niche like maybe more niche is what's going to grow the sport not being more general mm. um, so when we do put a, an event on it's people that are really interested in running get to watch the running and if you're going to put a long jump event on well you can market that to the long jump fans mm. And then the and, long jump and the fans long jump are in there. sponsors and stuff. Like you have different sponsors yeah. for different hours of the live stream. You just have your – I've thought about this. You just have your, your distance running hour on the live stream and then you just get sponsors who just want to sponsor that hour and then you get commentators who just know the stuff about distance running and maybe you ask the distance runners what events do you want, what the pacemakers to go out at. Like talk to Nick Bado. He can put that field together on a Friday morning around the 10. Imagine what he could do over there with the help of the federations. There should have been a live stream going for this. There should have been people on bikes, live splits. They should have told people about it, people on different corners, of course, still mm. keeping their distance. Like, this could have been one of their greatest things. Like, I know Craig Mottram didn't know anything about it. Like, no one asked him if he wanted to go down there and watch it and, you know, maybe hand over the record in some kind of significant way if it was to go down. Like, it's just, yeah, they had a huge opportunity. If the if if this wasn't a, a training group putting this on, mm, yeah, I I think what you might find if you play it that way is that you'll realise some sports are heavily followed, and some sports have zero following, and um, they're just in not sports, but I mean disciplines within track and field, and uh, they're riding the coattails of other disciplines within the same general classification of track and field. Mm. So it could, be, if you went that way, it would spell the end, I think, for for lots of events. Um, but what it might do is it might really pump up those that are that are, are sort of being pulled down by the others. Mm, yeah. We've, well, we've heard um, from a few guests about you know that um, the night of ten thousand meter PB, like that you know that race they have over in the UK. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that's a perfect example where it's niche. You know, it's like. It's put on for distance runners, and those that will turn up to su- to support will be the ones that are interested in distance running. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's where I'm ripping that idea off, Brad, this one that we're trying to get off the ground, where it will be like a, a similar concept, but it's going to be 5K. So a day of 5K PBs, there'll be a break in 23-minute field, a break in 22, 21, 20, 19, all the way down to 15. And then we're talking about this kind of uh, cool teams component at the end there where there's going to be four people on Team Brady, four people on Team Brad, four people on Team Moose. We'll pick our teams. And then wherever you cross the line in that 5K race at the end, which is going to have a pacemaker for the first 3K going out in 8.30 pace that you have to sit behind and then the race starts. Wherever you finish across the line, that's how many points you get. Team with the lowest points wins. Mm. It's going to be you a great also, concept. You can I'll also pick do, my team too, guys. Um, a bit like what Moose is doing with his um, run strong stuff with average average time. 
Could do it that way yeah. too. Yeah, we could do it like that. Mm. I like the point system though because I think coming down the home straight, like if you can if you can beat someone in the home straight, it could give your team the whole win. Yeah, but every but then it means every second's important as well when you're True. looking at averages. Mm. We could do whichever one my team's going to win. <laughs> anyway, oh, yeah. It's a good concept. Do you can tell me about this next bit, Brad? This uh, what was it? Team Norway destroying Team Kenya. This yeah. was another innovative thing. Talking about innovation, these guys are killing it over in Norway. I feel like I say it every week, Norwegian listeners, I'm going to come over there and live in your country and do a bit of running, I reckon. Yeah, so they had a 2,000-metre um, a race. Uh, there was five on each team. Um, so there was a race being held in Norway, and then there was a race being held in Nairobi in Kenya at the exact same time. Um, and then it was, the, I think, the total time for the top three people to cross the line um and so yeah team norway won that um with the ingebrigtsen uh brothers and um who was it uh one of them who, who was it that broke Jakob. no no yeah so he broke the european um 2000 meter race but then his brother broke yeah, the philip yeah philip broke the um norwegian thousand meter record about 45 minutes before he had to back up and do a 2k so that would have been pretty brutal for him and two um, to 16 for a k yeah yeah and um jacob jacob ran 450 for the 2k um so yeah norway won it was a bit of a train wreck actually in uh the kenyan team in nairobi they had um shitty conditions but then like i don't think I don't think the Kenyans have been training real hard during uh, during the COVID <laughs> crisis. Um, well, just even chatting to like Jake Robertson, saying that those guys aren't doing a lot over there at the moment, and obviously that was a you know a couple of months back, but it just looked that way. Um, they didn't even have three finish, I don't think. Yeah, it looked, yeah, it just looked, it was, it was a train wreck. And they went out way too hard, and they all blew up, and yeah. The pace was looking like he would have to score for a while there. And that component of it was just kind of like the fun component. I don't think anyone really cared that it was Norway versus Kenya. Yeah. Um, but I did like how the Norwegians at their track, they had the the pacing light going around the inside of the track. Yeah. Like, and that's another cool innovation. Like, can you imagine if we are putting on these breaking 20 races and you've got, you know, 20 punters lining up to go on the track and that light's going and you just got to stay with yeah. the light like it'd be so cool and then our mate Sondre Moen good listener to the show he he got on the track for 25k and he um broke the Norwegian no the European 25k record he ran 62 and a half laps on the track um he split the half marathon in 61 24 in total, he ran one hour, 12 and 46 seconds. He, uh, I think he took like over a minute off the record. So I love how they've looked at these records. I know for the hurdlers out there, there was a 300 metre hurdle record that went down as well. They just looked at which records they could get. This is going to be an exhibition day. Let's just go out there and nail whatever records we can. Let's invite the, the marathon guy down. Let's get the 1K one. Let's smoke up team Kenya. Doing some good stuff in Norway. Yeah. Would have yeah. been cool to see those, uh, say, the top top five boys that ran the tan, them doing the same thing would have been interesting. Yeah, it'd be cool, wouldn't it? Like if every week we tuned in and, like, winner takes on. So, like, Norway's got to take on Australia next and then winner of that takes on America. Like, can you imagine Bauman Track Club or something like that having a go? Yeah, I don't know. I feel sorry for the team that uh, has to keep backing up every single week. At some point, they're going to be pretty tired. Mate, Philip can back up 45 minutes later. He'll be all right. Yeah, he struggled. He was off the back. Yeah, it's still, still a pretty good day out for him. As athletes, we face challenges and adversary all the time. We thrive on overcoming them, and it is a natural part of what makes the experience so rewarding in the end. We set up goals to motivate us and keep our focus sharp. We push each other to get through those grinding workouts to go that famous extra mile. These days, we're all facing a different kind of challenge, and even though you might be training alone right now, we are here to keep you going. Between the 18th and 21st of June, Morton will double every order placed. This is a great opportunity to try Morton's innovative hydrogel technology, share an order with a friend, or start using the product in training in preparation for your next race, which appears to be getting closer. Yeah. Uh, listen to question, Bradley. All right, this week's listen to question comes in from Alice Wilkinson. She says, I'm in the process of returning to running after having a baby last year. I did little to no running for about a year and have been slowly returning to running and building the last 12 months or so. I was planning on working towards Melbourne Marathon. 
However, with the current situation, that doesn't look like uh, doesn't look possible. I have heard you all talk about how now is the time to maybe back off your training a little and maintain. But what about those returning or new to running? Mm. Good, good question, well, Alice. I th- you probably need more um, more context for each individual person. Uh, like in my mind, you like as a beginner runner or those returning to training. Like you still you don't plateau or stop your progression when it's so low already. Um, the, like the backing off trainings for someone who's been riding the line for a while or who um, who's struggling with some niggles or like is running pretty high significant mileage and the only time that they can really progress something is, is to peak or to really sharpen for something. So I don't think it's the same situation. We treat people differently like that. Like this is probably an opportunity for, for a new runner or someone progressing to like – increase mileage without the risk of losing a race situation come up so you can start to to do things that maybe you wouldn't do if there was a race to lose Mm. so everyone's in different spots and and like we like as as a coach i have runners returning to training and you they're actually the most motivated at the moment because they're getting these little teasers of fitness and progression and they're thinking oh this is nice let's go again like i want more i want more rather than sort of being at the top of where or being at like 90% and they know that it's not smart to get to 100%. So they're kind of just losing motivation, treading water. Um, whereas those that are at like 50% are thinking, you beauty, I get to like progress. I get to feel the satisfaction of, of running faster splits in training. I do a time trial here. It's good progression and, um, and they get to catch up almost. So I, I look at this as a position to catch up Alice, not to, uh, not to to back off again yeah my wife's in a similar boat alice and she's just back to three days of running a week and got her long run out to like 55 60 minutes one workout and she's loving it like getting back in the routine and because there's no fun runs or like even park run and stuff to jump in at the moment there's no interruptions so it's just a really good time to string together the weeks slowly build try not to get injured Mm -hmm. and um you know you get a lot of satisfaction i can see that she gets a lot of satisfaction from just getting the weeks done and just when she sees i plan her training for free doesn't pay me (laughs) got her on the run to pb books but um just no invoices go her way um but yeah when you look back over the last you know, three or four weeks, her long run's gone from 45 minutes to 60 and she can see ahead and see what's coming and what's progressing. And I think um, having run at this time is really good for, for her and and mums who are coming back for not mm. just phys- physical stuff but the mental health stuff as well to get out and get away from the baby for a while as well. And one thing I've seen for people that are returning to running after injury is – like the risk of returning from an injury is you've got a goal that you want to get fit for and often it's short term. Yes, so right. because because there's not that at the moment, it means you can return without taking any risks. Whereas often runners return by take and they take risks to get fit for a race that's in four, four five, six weeks, whereas they don't have to do that now. So they can be a little bit more sensible and, and take their time or take some more time off if, if the body's not 100%. Mm. Yeah, it was a very good response from you, Bradley. Thank you. Moose on the loose? Oh, moose on the loose, yeah. So um, this, is an, this, is a, this is like a very general s- small rant or discussion, let's call it a discussion, right, about those people out there. And my long run title of the Strava kind of alludes to it. Um, so my the title of my Strava I think was something like there are those that want it and then there are those – that talk about wanting it and they're very different people um and they're very different situations like so everyone's been on instagram lately because it's covid we're following people more everyone's got more time they're deciding to post start podcasts make videos you know we've all seen it happen (laughs) um and you're getting this this uh motivational athlete come along that maybe we haven't seen too many of in the past that loves putting up motivational quotes, tell us all how good they're going about how they're committed to training and how they've woken up early today to do this workout. And there'll be a hashtag like, um, got to want it or some shit like that. (laughs) (laughs) But what you see (laughs) 
is when a situation comes along and a option presents itself that what we'll consider is the easy option, they're the first to grab it. And then there are those that people that come along and without anyone watching or without posting a single thing, there's an option that comes along to them personally with no one judging them that's an easy option. And then there's the option that they know they're not going to enjoy, but they know is good for them. And they know that's what they need to do to progress and get better. And there's two people, some take that path and the other take the easy shortcut path. And I've been really noticing a, a breakup of the two people lately. And I think I'm getting better at telling the difference between the two. And um, it's just, it, I mean, it's it's psychological stuff, I guess. Like it's, it's sort of, um, people like the idea of committing to something, but when it gets to a point where the commitment starts to affect how they enjoy the rest of their interests as in hobbies socializing relaxing all this sort of stuff they start to that, that commitment starts to look less attractive to them um and I, i'm like i'm looking at uh, for me like i i know the difference between the two um i've taken the the easy path so often a lot and i know and I, there's been times where i've taken the harder path um, and I'm seeing a lot of people at the moment get presented with both going down the easy part, but talking about going down the hard path. What a rant. Fun. Oh, geez, good deep, hey? What a rant. Yeah. Hope someone types that out for us and like post on social media. I want to know who he's referring <laughs> yeah. to. Yeah, start dropping oh, names no, with. So yes. is it someone on your long run? <laughs> no, no, no. no it's, very, no it's a bit cryptic. It's a bit cryptic. It's not really. If you play that out, it goes for business. It goes for big life decisions. It goes for study. It goes for like athletics. Mm. Um, it's for relationships. It, it, it covers every base that like the idea of committing to something and and sometimes it's making decisions and, and committing to things that you know you like you not, might not enjoy for a longer period of time or even in the shorter period, but you're going to get gains from it. Um, and the gains won't show up immediately. They'll show up in a long time. Or you can have the short-term satisfaction of picking an easy option and enjoying the next hour, the next week, the next six months without stress or without, mm. um, without any type of distress or discomfort in your life. What triggered this though, Moose? No, I'm getting way more phys- – like this is what – I'm getting deeper now. All these long drives, oh, I've just been thinking – I'll go on for you, Moose. Some would some would argue if you have a um, 5K time trial, <laughs> the, the hard option, the most difficult option yeah, would, be to go, would, would, would be to go from the gun and put yourself in the hurt and see what you can do. The soft option would be, oh, I'll just sit with the boys for 3K and then delay the hurt. Yeah, you could, you could think that. <laughs> or you could look... Like I'm not, I'm not saying I'm taking <laughs> I'm just, the hard option. No, this, just, this isn't just, a, yeah, yeah. I, I understand what you're saying. saying. <laughs> I didn't want to turn this into a I'm a hard man taking the hard option. There's not what I'm. That's not what this is about. So yeah, I can I can cop that and look. Hey, that that morning, like I wanted to run with the group. Like I feel like there's a benefit for me to the rest of the group to be around. Like. Uh, I think it's good for a group to have someone around that's that's um, it's, elite. Just, yeah, well, just not when they're hurting in the fourth and fifth k when they really needed you. When the pacemaker drops out, just to win because I crushed them. <laughs> pacemaker drops uh, out three k moose leisure as well. Sorry, boys, hang on yourselves. Poor what Hutchie, I'm, what, you what I'm referring to. You know what I'm referring to. It's not me. It doesn't involve me. I actually don't know what you're referring to. What are you referring to? You haven't seen that where some people will be like. Oh, yeah, 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 like the Insta, yeah, yeah. You talk about someone, you heard them all the time, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to move here and I'm going to open this business and then I'm going to train for this race and when I train for this race, I'm going to I'm gonna be running long runs like this and, hey, I'm going to do a workout and at this workout I'm going to do this and you're like, you fucking all talk. Just yeah, get out there and do it. It's like a fad. They go, through, they go through a fad and then, like, you know, they'll start doing something but it doesn't stick. Whereas you, you, you need, you need yeah. to set up those set up those habits that last a long time, not just a month or mm. six weeks. Yeah. It, yeah, exactly. And it's like taking a like it's, at some point, it's leaving your comfort zone, and and not in a way that 
you would expect. Like leaving your comfort zone, knowing like, oh yeah, you get home and there's an option there to sit on the couch, drink beers or or go out with the boys or whatever. And you know the option, like that's an option. And then there's another option over here that's like, fuck, seven, I know. Seven, I know. 7K on a Sunday Arvo. I've got to go for a fucking <laughs> jog tonight. Or um, look, perhaps jogging's not a great idea tonight. I've sort of been a bit sore. Maybe that's the, like, that's the hard decision that you need to make. Oh, the boys are out for a run and it's going to be great. And we're going to get like, and oh, but shit, this niggle's been bad. I really need to rest it. You know, the hard decision right there is to not run, you know, like it's not all about doing the most, but yeah. it's about making the decisions that go against what you actually, um, what, what you might enjoy. Mm. Oh God. Fuck. One of the best boosts on the looses we've had, I reckon, Brad. I like 137. I like starting it. Starting was... up this life coach business. Uh, yeah, well, actually, that's what I was, was, was going to say. I said, I feel like Moose is slowly transitioning out of the shoe store yeah. to become a bit more of a motivational speaker. The so I've got, of Australia. There's a podcast tomorrow I did with a life coach. It's like a – um. It's called, you did it. Yeah, yeah. So No, I was the interviewee. Oh. Um. Hold up, let me find what it's called. Moose's flavor um, of the month on these podcasts. Oh yeah, we play, and, fully plugged podcast. I was on the bed with running podcast this week too. If you want to listen to me, bang on, get on. What is that? What is spoke, that? spoke to you boy? Spoke about you boys on there actually. What is the better running podcast? Better with running. I hope you pumped up my tires as much as Moose did. Pumped up your tires. So now, the, the question was, how's it go having Moose as a coach? That was a good question to answer. I think that's part two though. Anyway, Moose, what's the podcast? Oh, you it's on? called the Wonder Lusters mind podcast um do you charge money to go on these podcasts or just do it for free <laughs> do i charge money to go on a podcast yeah <laughs> i should be charging you fucking money to go on this one yeah i don't know about that i made you famous <laughs> didn't i <laughs> no one knew who you were before telling me tales the one the last podcast is here i'm gonna put it up i'm gonna post yeah. it it's we get deep on that one we talk oh. i'm gonna start my own fizz a lot i've got to work that word out first philosophy philosophy oh life do you, coach um do, do you know you talk, who i love do you know do you what about i love the navy in there oh i love listening to soldiers talk like those that have been in battle because that shit that i would have no fucking idea about you know i don't find many runners they're not my heroes like i don't look up to them they feel like normal people they feel like like they like i've seen them they're nerds right i they're great at running but i don't follow them like and I don't really love listening to podcasts about them. Um, but then you get someone who does shit that you know you'll never do and that you've never heard of or never experienced. Like listening to a doctor today on my podcast, on, a, on some other podcast about who's a special operations doctor. So he was like, he would follow the special operations teams in, in Afghanistan and he would be the, the doctor on the ground. Like, And he's talking about that sort of situation and what like what the skills are um that you you need on the ground and he was he said the best thing like it was i just listened and i thought that's amazing it's you could use that forever he said the training and the systems are so uh, like you're so well versed in your training that when you get to a life or death um situation on the ground in battle it's it's just so routine and so ingrained as to what you do you're not stressed it's just like it's another day of training for you because it because you do it so often, um, and I think that's really like you can. That's why we practice things, right? Mm. As a as a runner, that's why we practice being hurting at the four k mark of a five k, or we practice doing a hard long run, so that when we get in these races, it's so systematic and so like ingrained in you. You know what to do. You don't panic. You're comfortable. Um, it's yeah. Anyway, I just I I find like it's good to listen to those kind of people because there's never more stress than life or death situations. And if you can, if you can listen and f sort of take things that they've done or that works for them in those situations, then you can apply that in lots of places. It's so primal, like life and death, like what you do, what decision you make now, if you make the wrong one, you die. If you, if you're, if you panic and, and, and sort of seize up and you don't react, you're dead. It's so primal. I fucking love that shit. Mm. <laughs> didn't, uh, I didn't I didn't expect that tonight, did you, Brady? Yeah. I was trying to find this Wonderlust one on on um you sure it's a podcast? I can't find it anywhere. I was, trying to, find this on the, I was trying to find this on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> the Wonderlust yeah. is mine. Do you know how to spell it? 
W A N D E R L U S T. The Wonderlist Mind. Oh, I was just talking. The Wonderlist is. We'll put it in the show notes if we can find it, ladies and gents. Uh, what's coming up in your life, Bradley? Maybe having a baby. Not you, yeah. but you might. Viv might. Possibly. Um, yeah, it's meant to be another week and a half, but you never know. It could come early. Um, outside of that, I'll just be, yeah, school Wednesday. Um, yeah, and hopefully running every day this week. Moose, what's coming up? Listen to a few podcasts. <laughs> yeah, can't wait to get in the car. Just listen. Um, I'm going to – I'm working Ballarat tomorrow, doing a workout with um, the boys Tuesday night. That'll be fun, back in the group. And then, you know what? Not hey, Moose, it just, just reminded me of something, actually. Like, because, oh, you, because you loved that podcast, hearing about, you know, the, the soldier, have you thought about going back to the Navy? Oh, <laughs> I think about it all the time. I'm a yeah. bit old, though, for this shit. Yeah, maybe. I just thought, uh, yeah, you were were a military boy for a little while. Yeah, I'm not very good at it. I wasn't very good at it, but, you know, now I come back, I'm thinking, oh, I'm more mature. I could, like, I was thinking about it today. I'm like, all those opportunities where I fucking failed, I go back, I change that. I'm better. I know, I would know how to do it. Be the grey man. Like, anyway. I'm wrapping this up. <laughs> <laughs> was it, yeah, I think I found your podcast too. Was it with some girl called Abby? Abby Lewis, yeah, Anglesey yep. girl. Found her. See this, moves back to town, Brad, uh, straight, straight onto the local podcast. <laughs> She's from Mount Beauty. She was a yeah. good sprinter. He'd be Beach sniffing sprinter. around, I reckon. He would have been sniffing around. Uh, this <laughs> week's interview, Matthew Close, uh, 342, 1500 metres, 804.3K, 1358.5K. 63 for the half, 213. English fella. Lives in Wales, though. Absolute legend. You've listened to this one, haven't you, Brad? I have, yep. It's always um, interesting when you're Skyping people up that you've never spoken to before, like obviously lives on the opposite side of the world and you've never met him or seen him around at races or anything like this. So you go in a bit... Uh, going a bit blank, but yeah, man, this fella, we had a good yarn. We had mm. some fun conversations. I felt like I'd known him for ten years. We were, we were chewing the fat real good, and just um, yeah, just a legend. Like yeah, I've always had my doubts of people that live over that side of the world, but after this, got full faith in uh, the people that live over there. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. We'll be back next week. Thanks to Sticks Brewery for supplying the beers tonight. Anything else we need to add, boys, before we go? No, all no. good, I think. Um, done. Yeah. Contact me at um at be strong life coaching <laughs> Mind stronger or something like that. Yeah. See you fellas. See you guys. See ya. All right, welcome to the Inside Running Podcast for the interview this week, all the way over in Cardiff in Wales, I think, is uh, Matthew Clowes. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Brady. No worries at all, mate. We're just saying it's uh, 4.30 p.m. over here in Australia, and I think it's 7.30 a.m. on your side of the world, so I've just cracked open a beer, and you're probably having a coffee, I reckon. Yeah, I don't think I'll be cracking a beer at this time of morning. There'll be something up with me if I was. I'd be a bit concerned if that was the case. (laughs) Hey, uh, Matt, before we start getting into your running story and stuff, I want to share with the listeners just how uh, us at the Inside Running Podcast come across you, if that's all good. Yeah, it's good, mate. Yeah. It's probably, uh, I, well, actually, this is when you officially became on my radar, but I did start to notice a couple of things that happened six or 12 months ago that I'll bring up as well, but pretty much... Start of April, I went out and did a workout, the uh, 15 by one minute hard, one minute float. I set a bit of a challenge to all our listeners and uh, Bradley and Julian, who both didn't accept the challenge, that if any listener could do that workout quicker than me and staying over a certain float pace, not just going out and smashing 30 minutes, that I'd give them a free Patreon subscription. Um, And I think your wife, Gina, might have talked you into actually having a bit of a crack at this so she could benefit from the Patreon subscription. 
and then all of a sudden he, every man and their dog screenshot and this workout you've done sent it through to me and now here we are here we are kind it's of accurate around. <laughs> yeah it is yeah no um gina she basically just said to me um because obviously we're both we're both listening to the listen to the show and big fans and all that and uh uh, yeah, she just came to me and says, oh, um, Brady, I think Nick Hill did it as well. Yeah. And um, says, oh, I was just getting back into my running. I thought, oh, I'll give it a bit of a crack. And uh, to be fair, though, it kept me honest because I was only back training after having a bit of time off with quite a big injury. And um, it <laughs> it was pretty hard, though, to be fair. You're not meant to say that, though. You're meant to say you're in career best form and you're only just <laughs> Well, no, I was coming back. I was coming back into good nick. That's but, right. Um, I tell you what, it was it was tough. It was tough. Like there was there was times there I was like, oh, I didn't think I'm gonna do it. And then looking back over some messages with Gina on our Instagram, I do remember saying to her like probably six or twelve months ago that her husband, when I figured out, was you, and you'd kind of ran two thirteen at Berlin and got a a stack of uh, awesome PBs, which we'll go through in a minute was uh, a listener of the podcast straight away. I was like, shit, we've got to interview this guy. We don't have too many, like, you know, sub-214 guys listening. So we're finally there. Oh, no, it's all good. It's all good. Before we kick off, what's uh, your Monday morning looked like? You've already been out for a jog pretty early. Yeah, I know. Just, um, well, it's, a, it's a, like an, it's what we call them bank holidays. It's like a national holiday. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, actually, it's actually pretty nice today. It's a nice sunny day and... Um, so off off work today as well, which is also nice. But um, you know we're still we're still in lockdown over here, so um, there's not that that much to do apart from walking around and running. To be honest. Yeah. So you're based in Cardiff in Wales, but you run for England. Is that correct? Yeah. So I'm English. Um, Gina Gina she's Welsh, so we we'll be living in Wales. <laughs> yeah. So. Gotcha. That's the connection there. Hey, uh, yeah. as we often do on the Inside Run podcast, I'm going to go through your PBs. Hopefully, I've got these correct. Tell me if I don't, if that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. 800 metres, 149. Yeah, that's right. Some speed in the legs. Can you remember much about that PB? Once, once upon a time. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of dabbled at all the distances um, sort of throughout the sort of 10 years or so. Um, yeah, I, I can remember it quite vividly, actually. It's, um, it's one of them where... Um, you know, it's an hundred meters, and you don't really, you don't really think too much of it. You just kind of run as hard as you can, and whatever time at the end will be, type of thing. But uh, yeah, no. It, once upon a time, I uh, did have some like uh, some speed in the legs. Can you remember what you split halfway in? Because one like sub one fifty is not mucking around. Yeah, so I think I ran, I ran, I think I ran under one fifty twice. Um, I was never that quick, sort of um, out, out of the blocks. It was more of um, I, to be fair, I think I even split most of the times I ran under 150. Um, but I went, I, I, I used to go off pretty slow and then sort of um, ramp up the last 200. Yeah, right. And then uh, the 1500, 3.42 with the 3.59 mile also. So you're a sub four minute miler. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Surely the 3.59 means more to you than the 3.42, 1500? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into it at some stage as well, but um, I came from a small little NAIA college in the States and um, trying to get in these big races was quite difficult. So, um, yeah, I was well chuffed when I did that. Um, you know, there's not many runners in the NAIA, which is like a, quite a few divisions down from like the, the main the main divisions. Um, we're running sub four, so yeah, it was a pretty special moment, that one. Yeah, for sure. I've got that on my list of things to get to, the move to America, but I'll keep rolling through these PBs. Uh, 3K, 8.04. Yep. Yep. 5K, 14.05 on the track, 13.58 on the road. Yep. When I looked at that today, I was like, you need to do some work on that 5K, I reckon, because every other PB, maybe a 10 as well, but every other PB is pretty, uh, I reckon, just a, a step up from those from those two. Would you agree? I definitely agree, yeah. That's it was just a case of um, moving coaches and just not having enough time to sort of stick at one distance, I think. Yeah, and I'm not sure what it's like over there, but in Australia, like, we have very little opportunities to run fast, 5 or 10Ks. Like, you might get one or two a year, and if it's, you know, terrible weather, the pretty much chances of running fast are gone out the window. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's the same here. It's getting better, but, yeah. 
um, half marathon, the listeners will be able to relate to this one, was hopefully, if I've got it right, 63.26 at the 2018 Commonwealth Half Marathon Championships, the one that Jack Rayner won. Uh, you were 10th yeah. overall, just behind Dewey Griffiths, and yeah, pretty special race, and obviously if that's where you were living at the time, it would have been pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it was. It's uh, and a lot of people from around uh, around Carly supporting it. it was uh, it was a pretty special day because they put that event with the actual card of half marathon, didn't they? Like it wasn't standalone championship. No, nah, yeah, it's, we have uh, we have Carly half every year in October, and um, yeah, they just stuck it on onto the back end of that, I think. Yeah, and I was looking at some of the old results from Cardiff today, and. Um, that's pretty deep. Like they're often under sixty minutes. There, I was pretty surprised just how good quality that field is. Yeah, no, it's um, it's an IWF silver label, so it's um, it's getting up there as one of like the top ones to do in Europe. Yeah, cool. It's not the fastest of courses, but it's a it's it's a decent course and good atmosphere. Can you remember much about um, Jack? Was he on your radar at the time on that day? <laughs> Um, not not so much, no. I mean, I saw the back of him for about two miles. Um, no, nah, he wasn't on the radar. Like, you knew not who he was in Saka? Yeah, 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 I knew he was, yeah. I mean, he, I was, to be fair, there was quite a lot of Aussie boys um, what I ran with for most of the race, actually. Uh, but Jack was a little bit ahead. Yeah, I saw, like, I think Nick Harmon. I reckon you were really close to him, the, the Australian runner from over in WA. I reckon he was real, real near you. Yeah, I think there's a, a lad called, is it Gabri Selassie? I'm, I'm, I'm probably butchering his name wrong. Yeah, Dejan um, Gabri Selassie. No, you got it right. That's him, yeah. Yeah, I was with him. Then there's another, like, um, shorter shorter guy as well. There's yeah. two of them. I can't that, remember the other guy. That would Maybe have been that Nick, him. yeah. He's, yeah, he's really oh, short. Oh, okay. So like, that performance, <laughs> like, you are pretty stoked with that that day? Like, 10th in that quality race, like, that's pretty impressive as well? Yeah, no, it was. Yeah, it was good. Um, it was really good. And um, Der- Derby Griffiths as well, he's like, is you know fantastic runner over in the UK and uh, uh, just to see the back end back end uh, of the race and seeing him um, give me some confidence as well mm, for sure and then the marathon two thirteen fifty seven at the Berlin Marathon in two thousand and nineteen which I think was maybe I think you debuted in two thousand and eighteen at London and then um, you know pretty impressive second time up at Berlin obviously yeah I mean my debut was a bit of a car crash if I'm honest but um. Yeah, Berlin was. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that's technically my official debut. No, you can't do that. You can't just wait till a good one and say <laughs> that's your debut. Oh mate, I mean London was a uh, was an absolute mess. It was just car crash from start to finish. Well, I've got the notes here about uh, London. Sixty-eight forty through halfway, finished in two forty-three. So obviously, not it wasn't all a car crash, but obviously maybe from fifteen twenty k on things went wrong. What happened? Oh mate, it was one of them days. I mean, um, I don't know whether you uh, you probably have heard it was really hot that day. Yeah, it was the year the Kip Chow like, had the orange shorts on, wasn't it? White singlet. That was the one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and um, there's quite a lot of hype in the UK as far as people, you know, um, run, runners, elite athletes doing um, doing London as a debut, and um, there's a couple couple articles of me doing doing this marathon as my debut and hoping to run like you know sub 2 215 as a debut and then um, the training went really well up leading up to it i think i was about three or four weeks um overcooked if i'm honest but anyway i'm terrible in the heat absolutely terrible and london's like renowned to be being quite humid as well and uh start this race and oh i think after four miles i was done like the heat just killed me and um, I can't remember much of the race, to be honest. I just remember it like uh, 20, I think it was about 20 miles. Like there's this um, bloke on the side of the street. Uh, he had this like massive ice pop, you know, like um, kind of like an ice lolly. Yeah. And uh, um, I just remember him shouting my name. I'm some complete stranger. And I was like, he was this bloke. But anyway, I, I went over to him because I was, I couldn't, I was seeing stars. And uh he uh, he got this massive ice pop out, and he says, "Yeah, Matt, take take this ice pop, and um, you know, get some sugar back in your system, type of thing." And uh, anyway, so I grabbed this massive ice pop, must have been like you know six or eight inches long, and um, I was running with this freaking ice pop for about two or three miles, <laughs> sucking on this ice pop, and at like twenty twenty three miles, I was like, I was trying to jump the fence to get out because I I was like, I've had enough. And then um, I saw another one of my mates, and the crowds were so deep that um, 
you know, you, it was hard to even like try and jump the fence because there was so many people. And anyway, I tried to jump the fence and he's like, oh, you might as well finish now, mate. You're at like 23, 24 miles. So I was just like, I was walking a little bit and then jogging a little bit. And uh, it was just a car crash. And then I remember at the end, like when we went back into Elite 10, you know, all the top boys were there, like Mo and Kipchoge. And then um, Gina came over to me and uh, she was like, oh, you know, how are you feeling and everything? And I thought, oh, I feel horrendous, like I'm going to be sick. So anyway, I was in this elite tent with all the, all the other big boys, and uh, I had to I had to go into the into the toilets and put a bin on top of the toilet. I was just I was it was not a pretty sight, and then they had to stretch me out. So uh, it, was, it wasn't a good debut, that's for sure. Welcome to the marathon. <laughs> exactly. I want to I want to put a bookmark and go back to Berlin, but we'll keep staying here for London for a second. So. Like, obviously, your expectations with the kind of faster PBs over the shorter distances and running off the elite field um, would have been pretty special. And then you kind of said you are a bit overdone, but do you think you would have been still pretty fit? Like, was it that kind of build-up where you probably just did a bit too much work, so you still got the fitness there, but you're probably a bit too tired to race? Yeah, I reckon so, yeah. I mean, it was my first marathon build-up, and um, I think I did like a... I think I did like a 12, maybe maybe even a 14 week build up, which for me I think is a bit too much. And um, I was definitely fit. I was really fit going into it. And then the mentality, like you said, you're in trouble four miles in, so that's like six and a half k for people down here listening to that. Like that's a bloody long way from the finish line. So like you must have that that will probably be the hardest marathon you've ever run in your life. Oh mate, it was horrendous. Like it was absolutely horrendous. I mean, I couldn't. I've seen stars. I remember even like even before halfway, um, there was um, one of my friends. Um, um, she's a runner as well, but a a fellow was running on that day, and um, she was like handing me drinks and stuff. And I was just an absolute mess. I think as well as I just I got I stopped taking drinks on board at like halfway because I knew like I was done. And. Uh, I remember freaking Dan Wallace, um, you'll know Dan from New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. He ran that day. He had a cracker that day, actually. And um, he just ran past me and says, oh, you know, just keep going type of thing. I was like, I'm done, mate. And you're like, it would have been a shitload of people passing you too, wouldn't they? Like all the masses would have caught you? Oh, mate. <laughs> I think some guy I think some guy who beat me, I think he, he was wearing like these basketball shorts and he said he had his top off. I was like, oh, God. Not a good day, and yeah. I think um, I think Forrest, I think this guy is dressed up as Forrest Gump. He beat me as well. Yeah, that's funny. And then so like, share with us if you can. Like you get home that night, you're having dinner with Gina or whatever. Like, what are you saying to her about your future as a marathoner? Oh, mate. Like, I mean, to be fair, I didn't come round for about um, three or four hours after because I was so, I think I was just so dehydrated because I was in the medical tent after for about two hours. And uh, I was just lying on the lying in the medical tent with my feet on the chair, <laughs> and I was just like, "Oh God, I feel horrendous." But then um, when we got back, um, I was just like, "Oh God, I'm, I think I'm just gonna go back to 10k's for a little while." But to be fair, I think it was just the, the heat, mm. the heat. Like it was just it was just so hot that day, and I'm just I'm, I know I'm not very good in the heat, so I think that was just the biggest factor of it all was just the sh- the, the conditions of the day. Yeah, just zapped you, knocked it out of you. So then yeah. um, I did read maybe somewhere when I was doing some reading today that you may have been planning to do Manchester, which would have been like April, March of 2019 before then you would have ran Berlin. Have I got that right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So um, I had another build-up thinking I'll do, you know, I'll do a bit of a local um, local of a, a marathon just because, you know, it's just – after all London and everything, I just thought oh, I'll just keep my head down and do something just to, you know, just get a time on the board, whether it was, you know, just sub two twenty or something like that. And uh I um I ended up straining my hamstring about two weeks before it. I did a ten K and um my hamstring just pretty much popped at like nine K and um I ended up basically just dropping out of that race and then not doing Manchester at all but you know, I still got a pretty good build up from from doing um, from training training for Manchester, and then obviously that led into Berlin later on in the year. Yeah, so you've banked two marathon kind of preparations. London didn't go to plan. A little hiccup before Manchester, and then 
Tell us about Berlin. Like, isn't it just an amazing race to do for starters? Like the way the course is organised and the the kind of admin, I suppose, around it, like getting to the start line and how they look after you in that tent and stuff there. And then, yeah, how did you kind of think the whole experience went? Oh, I mean, it was just amazing. I mean, I know you've done it as well previously. It's just, it's just an amazing experience. I mean, it's just the Germans. They just do it so well, to be honest. Mm. Everything's just, you know, they do everything right down to the T. It's just, you know, from start to finish, it's just an amazing experience. Um, we didn't actually stay in the um, like the elite setup side of things. Oh, yeah. um, None of just... us got to stay there. We just we just get in that yeah. tent at the start. We're not that fast. Yeah, I was the same, mate. I just me and Gina, we just uh, stayed in an Airbnb. But um, yeah, it was good. Like you know, I mean, it's just it's just such an amazing experience, and the race itself, and the atmosphere, and everything about it was just, you know, even get getting you. Um, I managed to get drinks as well, and uh, you know, me and Gina just rocking up to this hotel, and you know, seeing all these amazing names and everything, and. We we always joke saying you know we see a runner going past oh they're they're definitely like you know sub sub two oh seven or something like that just as a laugh type of thing, and um, and then yeah so just it was just it's just such an amazing experience as a whole. And I think I saw a photo today of uh, Gina with Kipchoge. Was that at Berlin or was that at London? Oh no, she's um, she, she is, that was at London actually. And before we yeah. move too far on from Gina, we should mention she's pretty well credentialed as a runner as well. She's ran thirty four minutes of ten k and seventy seven for the half. Yeah, yeah, no, she's um, she's represented Great Britain as well, so she's um, she's all right. Yeah, she's a good runner. Yeah, definitely. So then Berlin, when you stand on the start line, what was the goal? Oh, I mean, to be fair, like the night before, there's a couple of other guys who um, I know pretty well, and they were like, "Oh, I'm gonna go." gonna go off because we had we had a, quite a few paces and they were gonna go off at like sub 213 pace and i was like well to be honest lads i just want to get a time on the board and um the goal was to just um go through halfway in like 67 or six around 67 and a half and then sort of um start pushing on so it was more a case of just getting a time on the board more than anything to be honest and having like a good experience of a race yeah, and at like sixty seven thirty, was there a pack? Because I know sometimes at Berlin there can be like really big packs, but then nothing for like thirty or forty seconds, and you can almost have to run solo for big chunks of the race. No, to be fair, like the first um, the first half was amazing. Like we had such a good pack, and we had a great pacemaker, and he he managed to get to halfway. I can't even remember my splits, but it was around sixty seven something. And um, you know we had we had great paces to be honest, um, and then. He was just not not necessarily a shame, but like after half after halfway, um, it, the pacemaker pretty much was just done. Like I kept talking to him, saying, "Mate, are you gonna carry on a bit longer, or shall I push on?" Because I could tell he, would, you know, he start he was starting to drop off a little bit, and um, I was just like, "Right, that's great. I'm just gonna go off after half and um, start pushing." And no one no one went with me, so I just carried on on my own. Yeah, you probably needed to get to 25 or 30 for an extra payday or something. That's usually how it works with those things. Oh, yeah. Like, to be fair to him, like, I was talking to him for a bit and he was like, yeah, I'm going to try and go another 3K or whatever. And then he, he would try and push on a little bit. Then he would just fall back. I'm just like, oh, mate, I can't I can't be doing with these surges. So mm-hmm. I just thought, screw it. I'm just going to go on my own and just start start bringing, you know, start um, pushing on and trying to pick up some more of the group ahead. And were you thinking about like the experience at London at all? Like it's pretty gutsy to push off at twenty one k, knowing that last time you're in the marathon things went wrong pretty quick. To be fair, I, I didn't actually. I didn't think of London at all. Like you know when you know you have done days as runners as well. Like you're just in that flow state, and yeah. um, you're just like not. You can't. You don't think of anything, and like all the way around, and you don't like your emotions are not involved into it at all you're just kind of running and you just you're staying in that zone and uh i was just like that the whole way around like didn't didn't think of anything else apart from you know running that next mile yeah that's that's the dream isn't it to be in those races when that happens oh yeah it was great like i mean from start to finish like i didn't really feel like i was absolutely like off my feet which means that you know it's a good thing knowing that I probably did undercook it as far as going off as conservative, conservatively as I did. But, um, you know, I didn't, I think it was only like the last half mile when I saw Gina, she was, she was shouting like, you know, come on, like get your ass in gear type of thing <laughs> that I, that I started like tying up. 
it's funny, you know, like my splits are really good and everything, but when you start getting like, not, not necessarily emotional, but like, you know, when you start bringing them emotions in, cause you know, you're coming to the end. Yeah. Like just that last half mile, I, hasn't, I just got knackered. Cause like, I think I just shut off from like being in that zone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and people don't get it unless I think you've ran Berlin, but the last two K you take about, I'm going to say four or five right angle turns. And it just kind of starts yeah. with your rhythm a bit. And I think emotionally, I've run it three times, and every time you're never sure which when the last one's going to be because your mind's a bit cooked at that stage and you just want to take one of those left-hand turns and see the Brandenburg gates. And you kind of lose your rhythm taking the tangents. And, yeah, that last 2K at Berlin is is tough. Oh, mate, yeah. I mean, I, I can't turn around corners the best of times. I'm like a Titanic. But, um, you know, like, it's just one of them. Like, it's just... Uh, you know the last that last last little bit like it just feels like it's going on forever as well yeah so you walk away from berlin 213 57 you got to be starting to think about um like if you are a bit more aggressive in the race that you can hit that olympic qualifier of like 211 30 at the time when this was you know tokyo 2020 was kind of on the radar yeah that was the plan yeah that was definitely the plan after after berlin and did you have a race like locked in or do you go to Stressy actually, didn't you? Is that right? Sacrum? I got a Stressy, yeah. yeah. I got a Sacrum Stressy. So uh, I had like, I, did, I didn't think I took enough time off after Berlin. I took like maybe 10 days off and started back running. I, I think I jumped into sessions too early. And then um, we actually got married to start of November. And uh, I was in, we were in back in Portland where we used to live in America. And um, I was like, oh, you know, you know, when you like, you get like hip issues and you think, like, oh, you know, you're, your SI joints out of place or whatever. So I kept thinking it was that. And uh, anyway, I kept running on it, thinking, oh, it's not getting any better, this isn't. And then uh, I, it's, it's surprising how, as a runner, you can run through so much pain and you just think, oh, you know, it'll come good at some stage. Never does. And uh, yeah, then I got a, 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 had an MRI like a couple of weeks after and got two stress fractures in my sacrum. So Hey, so uh, coronavirus coming through could be good for you, 2021. <laughs> Well, that was it. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna, um, I was actually, I was planning on doing London in April, but uh, I think it was a too quick a turnaround. Um, but yeah, no, things have things have actually happened in, in a sort of weird way. Is a good thing really for me as far as having a bit more time to prepare for anything what does come my way, maybe the end of this year. Yeah, for sure. And then um, take us back to the start, like. A lot of our listeners will be familiar with what junior running looks like here in Australia. What was it like, I guess, at a club scene? And like, what was your introduction to, to running? I think I read somewhere today, Ray Fowler was your first coach. And he sounds like a very um, interesting character, to say the least. Yeah, so I mean, to be fair, um, I think the Australian and the the British systems are very similar. I think like America is maybe a little bit different, maybe a little bit more intense. But uh, I started off like most runners really, but in a way like I started with football for quite a few years and uh, played football all the way all the way till I was about 18. And uh, yeah, Roy was my first coach. So there's, there was like a, a 10K, a local 10K, what used to go around my village. And uh so I did this 10k, and then this this old bloke <laughs> came up to me. He was, you know, he was about five foot two. He's really short bloke, maybe a bit taller than that. Maybe I'm not giving him much credit. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, he came up to me after I think I ran like 35 minutes. I was, you know, I was a big lad playing football as centre back. So you know, how old were you? I was, I, was um, I think I was 16. Yeah. Yeah. So he came up to me after, and then. Um, he just said to me, "It's like, oh, you should come down to this, come down to the track and join join our local running club." I was like, oh, "Okay, that'll be that'll be that'll be all right. Like, I'll come down and see what happens and see it might it might be good for my football." And uh, so I'll go I'll go down to the track this first this first Tuesday. Um, and we trained on like a, 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 a what do you call it an asphalt like the um, grit like a dirt track. Oh yeah, like the cinders kind of stuff, or just fully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, proper cinder one, like, and um, and so I, I trained and went down there for the first first time, and he was proper old school, you know, like just run run as hard as you can on the reps type of thing, and um, he used to try and get us all. Um, there was about three or four of us in this group, and he used to try and get us running in army boots and all this sort of stuff as well. Oh, and the that effect stuff. 
Yeah, yeah, he was proper old school, and um, and uh, yeah, so we trained with him, and uh, he he actually was the founder of the club, uh, Staffordshire Moorlands, and um, he found the club, and he was a great runner himself. You know, ran ran twenty eight minutes for ten um, k. He was, you know, he was a, a very good runner in, in his own in his own right. So he pretty much got me into the running side of things. And then, so, like, I know you went to college in the U.S., but, like, from 16 through, like, 18, 19, that was under his guidance? Um, well, 16 to um, sixteen to 18, and then I had another coach called Basha Hussain who trained me then from about 18 to, I want to say 18 to 20 before I went to the States. Um, he, was a, he was a great coach as well. He had a... A mountain background, um, and I think he got an international. He represented um, England and GB over all disciplines, you know, like mountain, road, track, cross country. So um, he was great at sort of developing me as far as the strength side of things, you know, getting me on the mountains. I did a little bit of mountain running as well, and uh, he was great at sort of developing me um, as a more of an endurance athlete than anything, really. And obviously your PBs would have um, like dropped dramatically during this time as well and like running became the main focus and you gave away the football? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I was still playing football. So that was um, for them first two years. I remember when we used to uh, train on the track on a Tuesday or Wednesday and uh, we'd have a football game before um, with my team and then I'd, I'd nip across to the track and do a track <laughs> session with Roy. He was absolutely fuming, he was. Um, he was like, what are you doing? Like, you know, you should be running, uh, you should be running full time now. But I used to do that all the time on Sundays, you know, we'd do uh, a game in the morning, then I'd go and run like an hour or 75 minutes in the afternoon. It was just sort of the norm and then as the running started to pick up and um, the, uh, the football sort of took a back seat but uh, I remember telling my dad, like, you know, I want to move from football to running, and he was gutted, you know, because as a dad, like, you know, you follow your son round as far as being you know, in the football team and all that sort of thing. And um, I told him that, and he's like, oh, well, see how that goes type of thing. And uh, I've done all right at the back yeah. end of it, really. Has his, has his tone changed now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's all right. He's... he's um, yeah, it's just one of them, Do you know. Like, as well in the in the UK, like you know, it's 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 like a family affair. Football is. It's like your dad, your dad play. You know, he r- runs a linesman. You know, or uh, he's one of the coaches on the team, sort of thing. But um, yeah, I think he came around in the end. Yeah, it's similar. Like I know in my area, like with AFL Australian football, like it's just diehards everywhere, and their sport gets so much coverage in the culture and stuff like that, especially in kind of small towns that have like one team and everyone follows that one team that it's kind of hard to compete if you're trying to do that with running in a, in a team sport like that that involves the community so much. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember the day like when I, I was like, right, I'm going to knock football on the head and um, everything like that. I used to get really bad ankles from running, you know, and not from running from football as far as like, you know, cutting in and out type of thing. I was like, oh, I'm done with the done with the football and let's sort of focus on the running and can you remember like the pbs at that time like were you more hitting the shorter stuff like the eights and 15s and like the three k's yeah i think so i think through school like it was more of um definitely cross country was um one of the one of the um sports that was what was massive as far as running as a whole and then yeah i think it was 15s and stuff like that i used to do a little bit of but um, I, I carried on doing a couple of 10Ks as well. Yeah, and like national level cross country as well. Like how are you stacking up compared to the rest of the country? Oh, mate, I'm shit. Oh, really? <laughs> I, was, I, I wasn't good, no. I mean, you know, I'd, um, it took me a few years. Um, back, in, uh, back when I was younger, like, you know, you just you used to run cross country in like your football boots type of thing. And, you know, you just, you just um, run as hard as you can at the start and then just fade at the end type of thing I, I had no clue what I was doing um, and then cross country uh, I think I think I came maybe top 10 nationally but that was like when I was 19 I think it would take me a few years to get to you know maybe the top top 10 top 20 in in England at least yeah and give me some more details about the culture of cross country running in England like I know Nick Earl spoken about a couple of times on um, the road to nowhere the kind of bonus show that he's on 
but it's seen and I've seen photos of like the courses and stuff like over here in Australia we pretty much run on golf courses and they'll make one little 10 meter muddy patch and the rest of it's kind of pretty good but um it seems like it's a I don't know like a more brutal kind of cross-country experience than down here oh mate it's brutal like I think that's one word you can describe it as brutal um, I think, to be honest, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to go to America, just because because the cross country was like <laughs> golf courses. Cause, get away from it, mate! Like I I can't run on mud for shit. Like I'm absolutely terrible. Um, I'm quite I'm quite a big runner, and I hit the ground pretty hard, and I just go straight through the mud. Yeah. I don't. I'm not one of them runners who kind of floats and glides over mud. And, and uh, uh, yeah, sorry, keep going. No, go on, mate. I was just gonna say the team culture around it as well. Like everyone takes it pretty serious. Oh mate, yeah, it's big. Like everyone loves it. Like it's, uh, and I, I, I used to enjoy it. You know, everyone, all the coaches say, oh, you know, you got to do cross country. They're, they're your sort of development years, and um, it is, it is one of them things. It's part of culture over here. But um, I remember one time we did a, a national cross country, and it was, uh, it was around our national theme park actually. Uh, on the back fields there and it was just mud was like up to your eyeballs all the way around and it was just horrendous and I think that was one of the days where I was just like alright I've had enough of this I need a change <laughs> spend more time on the roads and the track yeah that's it so the move to college like it's it's a move that we often hear people talk about um, when we interview a lot of kind of Australian college kids who go over there and run for a couple of years and then come home but what kind of inspired that move for you other than the to get away from the mud of the cross country in, in England? <laughs> I think like, um, well, I, I finished um, what, what's called college over here as far as like, you know, your last two years of high school. And uh, I was coaching at the time and um, just like in schools and stuff. And I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And um, I was actually going to go to uni earlier on in America to um, a place in Texas. And uh, but obviously my SATs didn't go down that well, so I didn't end up going there. But uh, um, I think well when I was uh, when we were both looking because I was with Gina, Gina, uh, we started sort of seeing each other. I think we were about six months, maybe a year, year of seeing each other, and um, we were like, oh, we wanna we wanna kind of look to um, maybe go to San Francisco or something like that to train with a few groups out there. Um, so we contacted a few um, a few colleges in Bash Bashir, who, who was coaching me at the time. He was like, because he, he went to an NAI school. He's like, oh, why don't you why don't you actually start thinking about going to a college in in the states anyway, and maybe go to an NAI school? You know, be a big fish in a small pond type thing. And um, so anyway, we we emailed a few few places, a few NAI schools. A few got back to us like, oh, saying we were quite lucky really. We were like, oh, we'll we'll take you both. Um, we'll give you like a full scholarship if you can come over in the summer. So I was like, all right, well, that sounds all right, doesn't it? You know, we'll see how, we'll see what happens. And we ended up staying out there for five years. Yeah, right. So there's the same kind of benefits, like you get the full scholarship. Is it like they throw a gear at you and a masseuse and kind of stuff like that that we hear like the Div 1 schools kind of provide? Oh, mate. Nothing? Uh, no, totally different. I mean, so we got the... Um, the coach um, at the time, his name was Randy, Randy Darzell. He was, he was, you know, he was, he was a good coach, good businessman more than anything, I think. And anyway, he picked us up and we, we stayed, uh, we stayed in the hotel for the first night. And then at the NAI school we were at, um, they're really religious. Oh yeah. And um, it was a bit of a sort of eye opener for us. So anyway, we rock up the next day. Um, obviously, we're together, boyfriend and girlfriend at the time. They were like, oh, you know, is our accommodation ready? And they were like, oh, what accommodation? Like, you can't, you can't live together because you're not married. Yeah, no sleeping in the so same like, room. Yeah, exactly. So we were like, oh shit, what are we gonna do now? Type of thing. And uh, we had like a, it was called like the cross country house. It was like, um, you know, like a, a chalet, like it's like a caravan without the wheels type yeah. thing. Yeah. Um. So we ended up staying in there for a few days. It was right by this, um, like really busy road and um. Uh, uh, railway tracks as well so you, you hear these trains going past like every 20 minutes or so and um, anyway we stayed there for a few days and then the coach picked us up and um, he took us he says oh your accommodation is not ready yet so he took us to this took us to this ditchy like um, dingy um, motel you know like the proper like sort of 
no tells you see on like a bloody you yeah, know the American movies uh, yeah. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. But you're, you're right the someone always you gets... see where someone's getting shot or something someone's always getting murdered in those ones <laughs> oh mate so we, we rock up um the coach he had like a bus company as well at the time so um he drops us off drops us off in this bus and uh, we we rock up to this motel it's called the golden spike and I, i'm not even making this shit up um <laughs> it's called the golden spike so you, you know um i don't know if you've ever been to any of these, these sort of motels just feed your money through like these little slots and it's like um there's like a plastic guard up and there's somebody on the other side uh, and it's that yeah, sort of yeah, rough, yeah. That yeah. proper rough anyway we, we get into this motel and then uh, we get into the room and um, we left one of our bags back at the chalet at the cross country house. So um, Randy went back to get, get that. And I remember, cause Gina went in there before me, she sat on the edge of the bed in the, this like horrendous room. And you know, in them times in your life, you're like, right, you've got to like take a step back and think, well, what are you actually doing with your life? What the fuck have we thing. done? Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck have we done? Was like, this worth a scholarship? Right? Yeah, she's sitting on this like floral um, bed. It looked horrendous, you know. And uh, she just had her <laughs> hands hands in her head, like you know. And uh, we, they, you have those moments in your life. You're thinking, like, what the fuck have we done? Yeah. And um, anyway, so I was like, right, we're going. We're, um, grab our bags. We're off. We're, we're getting out of this place. So anyway, we grabbed the bags and we waited at the end of the road. Wait for Randy back back from the back from the chalet um he's like I, and i i pretty much like had a go at him i was like listen here mate like we've traveled halfway across the bloody you know halfway across the world here to get to <laughs> get to get to you know run for your run for your team like you need to pull us up pull us up in the hotel at least you know so anyway like i think he got the message and by the end of it we ended up getting like a house and um you know it all sort of worked out in the end but um oh, mate like them first few days like you know everyone thinks like it's a you know it's a normal sort of scholarship set up and it, it really wasn't for us and to be honest it things just sort of started to escalate after that for like throughout the sort of last few years of being there as well so you stuck it out for the four years yeah, I mean, we stuck it out for five years. He actually left after the first year, and this is probably why my um, races took like a bit of a um, a bit of a change as far as doing different distances because I had so many different coaches. Yeah, okay. And um, so yeah, so anyway, June ended up moving after a year. She went to do a masters at University of Portland, which is just down the road. Um, and then um, our um, we're not actually supposed to um, pay for housing in NAIA it's only like supposed to be like your tuition so anyway we got our um we got our housing pulled after the first year when he left because I don't think he was supposed to be doing it <laughs> and um so I ended up I ended up having to work at his coffee shop for like you know 20 30 hours a week uh on top of you know running for the team and everything just to sort of um stick it out there and that's what we did for like yeah for five years yeah cool and then like is it just as heavy the um, the like you run for your team and you get as many points as possible and you do the best for the team in your cross country races? Like, is that team culture just as prevalent in the kind of uh, lower divisions? I guess. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I was just like, um, I was just one of like the race horses. You, you know, you used to just run me ragged yeah, type of thing. Yeah. Like, you know, at nationals, I'd be dubbing up. You know, tripling up. I'd be doing four or five races a day. Like it's just one of them things and just to get as many points as we possibly could. And that never changed throughout the whole time I was there. Yeah, I guess especially with your range. Like you can do everything from a you know, pretty quick four hundred through to a good ten K cross country race. Oh. oh mate, like some days, you know, I ran I ran a I ran a three fifty eight mile, half an hour later I was running eight hundred meters. Yeah. Um <laughs> it was that it was it was crazy. It was mad. Yeah, cool. So then you, you get your degree, you survive the US. Did you stick around for a while or come straight home? Um, no, we pretty much, I mean, I, I graduated in the April and then I think we I think we left America in the May, so didn't stick around too much longer after. And straight into like blue collar life then? Like does running take a bit of a, because I've, yeah, I've heard some stories about how you have to do all your training at 5am in the morning to go to your job and and you still run faster yeah. than everyone else that thinks they work blue collar on this podcast. That's for sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I uh, I actually came back uh, and then moved to moved to Cardiff because um, I'm not obviously I'm I'm not from Cardiff. I'm from uh, middle of England, um, and uh, yeah, I moved down here and then um, I started a masters and then ran my own business for a few years. And then uh, now I'm just I'm working in uh, the medical device um, industry, so a lot of travel, um, a lot of long hours. You're a clinical educator. Have I got that right? You go to like sell, right, yeah. sell medical equipment to like doctors and stuff like that, surgeons, everything in the medical space. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. Yeah, so we go in and go into theaters and train doctors and nurses and all sorts, but. You know, all of this since coronavirus, it's all sort of taken a back seat. I've never been at home so much, actually. Yeah, so when you say, like, you go into theatre, like, you're someone's getting operated in on and you're teaching them how to use the equipment, or is it like a practice run? Yeah, exactly that. So it, it can be it can be both, actually. So, yeah, I can be in... I can be in on on a case with a patient and um, you know the doctor's there and uh, they'll be using the equipment and um, I'll be telling them how to use the equipment while they're in, you know they're putting it into the patient. Jeez, that sounds like an interesting job to be, <laughs> to be juggling with, like you know, two thirteen marathon running, sixty three seconds for the half, sixty three minutes for the half. Yeah, I know it is like you know it's just early mornings and um, you know late evenings sometimes. I mean, it's nice at the moment because I've got a bit more structure, but day to day you know i could be um i could be anywhere because my territory is quite big so i could be you know a different hotel every night type of thing yeah so take us back to like say the berlin preparation maybe you're, you're four to six weeks out what would a i know it's hard because you travel to different spots and you do different workouts and stuff but a pretty standard kind of week of monday through to sunday look like with training and work uh, so pretty much, uh, like if I started on a Monday, it would be just getting up at, you know, half five, five o'clock and getting in or maybe a longer run. Um, it depends on the schedule of what I'm working. Cause sometimes I could be in hospitals at seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, depending on what cases they've got that day. So, um, I try and obviously work it around my schedule, but the, the main thing for me is just to get two, two side sessions in a week, whether that, you know, is a fart lick or an interval uh, interval session or a tempo run or a long run it, it sort of works off them four um four things really and um you know i keep it pretty simple uh, you know i run easy on my easy days and you know you've heard this a million times and you know you run hard on your hard days but it's as simple as that for me you know, I, don't, I coach myself as well, so it is it is easy in that sense as far as scheduling. Yeah, and having the two workouts gives you that flexibility when life gets in the way as well. Like, I feel like you can just move stuff around and fit it in knowing, or, you know, around your work rather than when it's three, it's pretty inflexible to fit three in, good long run. You just, yeah, you're cool. Yeah. I think that's it. And I think, like, um, I'm, I'm learning more and more about my body, obviously, as, as we're getting old, like, I'm 30 now, so... Um, you know, as far as the importance of recovery, and I think like you know, even if you're doing a long run, if you've done a session before, or you've got to like um, structure things as far as like what you what you're planning on doing for a, for the rest of the, that following week type of thing. Um, you know, if a long run's a session, make it a session. Don't just run a hard long run and then expect that you can sort of back up a good session like two days two days after it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and you're right because so many people get caught in that trap of it's Monday, it's a new week, we're going to roll through a standard week how we usually do. Whereas if you've had a Saturday workout and a Sunday long run, that's a lot of stress compared to say like a Friday morning workout, a Sunday long run. Like how you're hitting that Monday is completely different. Oh yeah, like you know, I mean to be honest, like I I run a lot slower now. You know, I've I've done every single type of training modality in the book. You know, I've run hard on my easy days. I've, you know, I've I've um, tried to do three sessions a week. I've tried I've tried everything. I've done everything, and I think this is the one method what works best for me is, you know, if if I feel tired, I'll take an extra day, and then I'll do another session, and then things get moved around. I think, I think young athletes these days they just get so wrapped up and right i've got a long run this day i've got a session on this day and it's got to be on these specific days yeah yeah for sure so like what are, i think we were going through a standard week and we got to monday but um so like what would <laughs> what would uh, you do two sessions a week and a long run in the build up to berlin or would the long run be um like a part of a workout when you're doing a marathon preparation and also can you maybe let us know what 
I'd say you'd probably work in miles, but if you know the kilometre splits for your easy days as well, because I think a lot of listeners would hear, you know, a lot of value in hearing what pace a 2.13 marathon runner actually goes when he's tired and actually recovering. Um, so, um, so a typical week, yeah. So do a session Tuesday and Friday, or if it's, if I'm doing a marathon specific session, it would be a hard long run every other week. Yeah. Um, that would be it. And then, um, I would always do the distance slow. If I was doing like a 26 mile run, I'd always do that distance slower before I would do like a session, if that makes sense. So like I'd run, Maybe one week I'd do 26 miles. I mean, this I've only done like maybe one, maybe two 26 miles ever. Do you know what I mean? Maybe 22 miles. Yeah. I'd do that. If I've not done that 22 miles a week, I'd do it slow. And then maybe two weeks after, I'd do it a little faster with a session involved, like, you know, whether it be a couple of four by four miles of the mile float or, um, you know, 5K efforts with a, a K float type of thing. Um, and then as far as, um, my other session would be like an interval session on the track, it'd only be simple things, you know, like 10 by three minutes, 12 by three minutes or K on K off type of thing. Um, and then easy runs. Oh, I don't even know what the bloody conversion is. Give it, um, give it so to us like, miles. What's, what's miles? So like I'd run like seven thirties, um, seven twenties. So that's probably like what four over four thirties, maybe Maybe around four thirties. I'm not sure. Actually, okay. you, you know what we can do? I'll look you up on Strava because that automatically converts it for me. Oh, you convert you, yeah. And yeah, I just saw that you'd done a run just before we um we jumped on air here. So if I scroll down and find this, oh, here we are. I'm gonna scroll through all this Julian Spence and Bradley Croker stuff. Gotcha. So the, <laughs> so today that was about yeah. You ran at four thirteen k pace today. Um, yeah. so yeah, that gives us some good context that you're not blowing the doors off on your easy runs, letting your body recover. Yeah, that's it. And to be fair, like I run, I run quite a lot of my easy runs with Gina as well. I did in the build up of Berlin, you yeah. know, just shuffling along, you know, heart rate really low. Yeah, it's good. So what kind of like influences have you had to, um, be able to self coach yourself? I think like I've taken bits and bobs from like all the coaches I've had, you know, I've had, I've had Roy, he was sort of like, you know, really, um, you know, balls to the wall type of, um, set up as far as that, you know, you're running hard type of thing and, you know, like a hard mentality. And then like, um, Bashir was more about, you know, feeling smooth, keeping things controlled. And then, um, not necessarily Randy, but um, I had another a couple of coaches as well. One being Bob Williams, who was you know part of the Steve Prefontaine um, setup. He trained with him and was coached by Bill Bauman. He was more of a you know it's all it's all about feel and you know um, type of thing and a little bit more about speed. So I think I've just taken little nuggets from all of these coaches I've had and then sort of brought them into my own sort of like coaching philosophy type of thing. And, you know, I've coached athletes as well, and I've sort of taken bits from what I've learned from them and sort of put them into my own sort of way of doing things. Yeah, and I do love before how you kind of said you listen to your body. So, like, you have these other influences, but at the same time, the influences only come in if your body's ready to go. Like, that's almost your first coach, listening to how your body feels. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that that is your coach, isn't it? And I think, mm. you know, we can have all this technology, we can have heart rates, we can have all these fancy watches. But at the end of the day, it is all about feel, and that's exactly what it comes down to. Mm. Hey, uh, before we finish up, let's touch on the future. Like, I was looking through the Doha World Championships marathon results today because I thought, and I did have it right, that there was only one GB runner there. You guys only decide to send one person. Um Looking into the future, is there going to be opportunities with the world champs and say Commonwealth Games, both being a bit of a uh, close gap between them? I think it's going to be two weeks. Like, there's obviously mm. going to be a few singlets up for grabs going forward for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 2022 is my aim. I mean, obviously, 2021 is still my aim. I know, obviously, to times it's it's such a weird time at the moment with times and everything like that. I just think it's everything's sort of gone out the window obviously with new technology potentially you know a big factor in that but um you know i, st I still want to try and run um the olympic qualifying time that's going to be one of my big aims for next year um i've got a few races sort of um, lined up for that but i think yeah 2022 is 
I'd, I'd love to run the Commonwealth Games. I think I'd take that over the world for me. Um, obviously, being in Birmingham as well, home games. I think that would be one that I'd love to do. Yeah, pretty significant. And then, like competition wise, like Mo's stepped down from the marathon back to the track. Like, who else have you got to look out for? I guess it's hunting for those same singlets when we're talking Olympics. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, Dewey I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, Callum Hawkins. Yeah. Um, there's a few others what will come out of the out of the woodwork. I'm sure there's a f- few athletes what are what we're planning on doing London, um, like Ben Connor and a few other uh, top boys as well. Chris Thompson being another one. So I think there's there's and I think there's so many um, there's so many potentials what could be up there. I think it's just a case of just seeing who comes out of the woodwork and who actually wants to give the marathon a good crack. And is it like fair to say that you guys have had a bit of a resurgence similar to Australia in like marathon running? Like I think I can remember maybe, you know, four or five years ago that the the best UK runner might have been running kind of two fourteen, two fifteen at kind of London, and now it's kind of dropped to you know two ten to eleven is kind of the standard now. Yeah, it's massive. Like you know, I mean, um, I, I mean, I, I'll I'll see people's results, and I'm like, they've just run two ten, and I'm like. And I, I, I feel like I can run two ten, and I don't know whether you know you can you can say about all this different technology, and I won't go into details and like crap. But I think like it's give people a bit more like sort of self belief that it, oh these things are possible, and you know people can run these times. I think that's what sort of started to come out as far as other um, race uh, other distances as well, like half marathons and ten k's. You know, the surge of ten k's and half marathons, people running stupid times. I think. Yeah, technology's got a bit of a factor in it, but I think people have just got more self-belief as well. I agree with you. Like, it's a lot more like, shit, I can do that kind of stuff now, right? And it could be because of the influence of the shoes and, you know, obviously that helps in a way, but I also think Mm. that then there's this belief that people, um, yeah, if he can do that, I can do that. Like, why not? Like, it's, and I think the goalposts have kind of moved a bit where, I know our team at the 2017 World Champs at London, I think it was. Like, we kind of had guys, if you ran under 217, 216, you're kind of on the team. Whereas now it's like, you need to run 212, 213, and if you even want to think about getting on a team. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I mean, fast times, like, it sort of, it breeds, like, people to, you know, think, all right, you know, I think I can run that. If that that person can run such and such time, I feel like I can run that too. And then they'll they'll try and run it and they'll run it and then they'll be the next person watch 30 seconds behind that person. And it's sort of like that trickle effect. But I think I think running at the moment is in such a it's such a, in such a great spot. I mean, definitely in, in the UK, especially, you know, people are running stupid times. And, uh, you know, I think it's something we should be applauding, not sort of sticking our nose up in the air and thinking, oh, well, you know, it's we've got all this technology now, like we sh- it's not like it used to be type of thing. I think we need to sort of ride the train of this is a good thing for the sport. Yeah, and if you look back, like it's happened, I know we're just thinking about some Australian names like the De Castellas and the Monty Gettys and the Troops and um, Derek Clayton's. Like we've had a lot of successful marathon runners who have ran bloody quick without any shoe technology as well. So it's it's fair to say that genetically we can do it. Absolutely, yeah. And I think I think like a sport is in such a good spot. Like I think we've just got to keep riding the wave and just continue doing what we're doing, but actually like applauding people for their performances rather than saying, "Oh well, what shoes are they wearing?" Or do you know what I mean? I think yeah, it's, it's more bullshit. than that. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing yeah. worse than when you've had. A, I've had you know. If, taking a few pbs down over the last six months and then it's that whole oh are you any better or you're just you know wearing different shoes like it kind of does your head in when you've just um yeah been training away and putting together weeks after weeks of uh, some decent training but it brings me to the question like are you aligned with any brand as like a 213 kind of 63 guy or i looked at a couple of photos and you some of them you had some asic stuff on some of them you had some nike stuff on some of them was a bit of a new balance that didn't seem like it but i could be wrong no, I mean I had a little asics last year, mate. But I, I didn't get anything. But like, it's just it's just one of them things, you know. I mean, I can. It would be nice, but at the end of the day, like, I can afford to buy my own stuff, and I think that's a nice thing. Is oh, if I want to try this pair of shoes, um, mm, yeah. you know, last year I was getting a few pairs from Asics. I was like, to be like personally, to be personally honest, I I didn't think they were good for me, um, you know. And then now I can be like, all oh, right, I want to try this new shoe. I want to try this new shoe. And, 
Um, but no, I, I mean, I've had nothing um, apart from just a little bit of ASICs uh, kit thrown at me last year. And with the England scene, like, is it an opportunity or like a possibility to have like career marathoners, guys that can do it for a job and make more than they would when they're working or it just doesn't happen? Kind of similar to Australia, I suppose. We've kind of got, you know, a few guys who do it for their job, but the rest of us have got jobs to support it. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 you've got to be running like 209, 208 type yeah. of, uh, times. I mean, to be fair, like, I, you know, there is there is a few runners out there what they can say, oh, they do it as a job. But at the end of the day, like, you know, if, if you stripped away um, everything else and you just had running, like, you, I mean, I personally would be bloody bored. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm so bored now I. and I'm yeah. working from home. Like, I'm like, I said to Gina, it's like, I don't know how people do do this, like, full-time athlete law type of thing. And I know, like, there's races. But to be fair, there's money to be had. Like, I've made a good couple of grand on the roads and stuff um, every year. Yeah. yeah. There is money to be had, definitely. I remember when um, I was thinking Rotterdam was going to get cancelled. I started sniffing around, like, Manchester and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, Manchester, like, it's... You know, when you start tossing up between going to a Rotterdam and coming 20th or 30th or a Berlin and coming 50th, you can go to some of those lower key road races over there and pick up a, you know, a couple thousand euro for maybe winning in 218 or 219. Oh, yeah. Have you have you uh, rocked up Manchester? You'd win it and you'd get at least two grand. Mm. I had, um, it was funny, I had uh, one of the uh, race organisers, because I get on with a lot of the race organisers quite well around uh, around Wales, and I had one uh, come round a few months back before all this corona, and uh, he uh, did a bit of a podcast with me. Yeah, I listened uh, to it today. I got... Oh, did you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I liked doing some God. research, yeah. Oh, good research, mate. Yeah, it was a good and, interview. Uh, I did see, actually, yeah. and then on their Twitter that they were celebrating that it had 25 listens. And I was like, shit, we're going oh, really? to get a few more than that, hopefully, on this one, this episode. <laughs> but but that might have been early days. It could have been like the first 12 hours or something. But yeah, big, I, uh, I'll big, listen to big it. Big fans on the podcast. <laughs> sorry, sorry to uh, overtake your story, though. Continue. Oh, no, it's all good, mate. And uh, anyway, after the after the podcast, the um, I said, oh, come, in, come into the kitchen. And I was like, this is what you brought me. I had <laughs> brought in your fridge with, the, fridge with the money. I was like, look what you got me. Type of thing. So there is money to be had. Yeah, and that's yeah, it's good kind of I don't know something that's really rewarding about picking up those little kind of fun run wins in a way like the road series and because you're not doing it for a job, it like I don't know I know whenever I get prize money it feels like extra special because you you don't do it for that and it's a nice little bonus to get when it does happen. Oh mate, yeah, I mean I think that's the biggest thing with just running like lo- do local races as well. Like at the end of the day, like we do, we do it because we love to do it, and it's just a bit of a laugh. And I love going to races. I race a lot, you know, when I um, like before all this, and uh, you know, it's just it's just nice to see the normal people you see and just have a bit of a laugh. Like that's what it's all about. Yeah, that community feel. Hey, last one for you, mate. You're a pretty uh, intellectual guy. What are you reading at the moment? What's on your bedside table? Um. Oh, uh, my missus would be uh, laughing, laughing now because it takes me about two years to read a book. But uh, I've got um, Diana Nyad. Um, she's a she's an American swimmer and um, like ultra ultra marathon swimmer. Okay. And um, she did like the swim from um, uh, it was uh, Florida to Cuba. Yeah. It's quite an interesting read actually. So. I'm reading that at the moment. They finished it, so it's taken taken me about two years to Good work. two years to read it. Start, <laughs> started in 2018. <laughs> Just digesting the words in it. <laughs> That's it. Doing a bit of a dictionary halfway through each page. That's it. <laughs> hey, uh, mate, we could do this all night. Thank you so much for uh, giving up some time though for our listeners, and it's been a really kind of entertaining chat. I've had kind of a ball just talking about the different cultures and the way the you know running works on the other side of the world and. If you ever want to come out to Australia, we'll be able to find a singlet for you in a, or rather an Inside Runner podcast team somewhere or the Bendigo Bats. We'd love to have you on our cross-country team. We've always got a, uh, a bed for you somewhere here. Keep us company running around at Chukamoama. And, yeah, really appreciate your time and um, sharing some of your insights tonight. Oh, no, thanks very much. I've, uh, it's, been, it's been a good laugh. Really enjoyed it. It has, mate. Cheers for that. Morton is an innovative sports nutrition brand that uses a unique hydrogel technology to allow for an increased carbohydrate intake and decreased GI distress. When used correctly, Morton will help to decrease under pressure. Keep an eye out for the Inside Running Podcast socials for a special offer this week. 
and also the running company Ballarat Socials, where we'll also be having this deal.